Hello everyone, I hope you're all staying spooky wherever you are. I'm excited for this week's episode. It is loaded with a collection of unnerving tales. Buckle up and enjoy the ride, as we journey further into Mr. Creep's mind. My Last Call as an LAPD Officer Written by Leo of Alexandria I was a Los Angeles police officer for over 13 years. I'd been in more life-threatening situations in that time than maybe 90% of the U.S. population. I've encountered near-death scenarios a handful of times. Being a member of the well-known LAPD SWAT team also has brought a plethora of adrenaline-induced insane moments. It was part of the job that I signed up for and wanted, and I was proud to serve. One moment, though, ended my career in law enforcement, and it had nothing to do with a routine call or anything police-related. It was part of my responsibilities as an officer, but it could possibly have happened to any civilian. I now live in a small trailer home near the Salton Sea, about three and a half hours east of LA. I barely scrape by financially, but I would rather have this peace of mind than what happened to me nearly two years ago. March 17th, 2020. The world has stopped. The streets are empty. Any other St. Patrick's Day would be filled with endless disorderly calls and drunk 20-somethings puking in every street in LA. But tonight, at the beginning of my 7 p.m. shift, it's like the zombie apocalypse had started. The county of 10 million people has seemingly disappeared. I can't even find a homeless person in the street. I've looked too. We have care packs to give out filled with hygiene products, dry food, and clothing. I've never not been able to give these out before. Obviously, everything is closed and there is no real 28 days later type of thing going on. Believe me, I'm not complaining, but it's still unsettling. The radio sparks up, actually making me jump for the first time ever. Usually the radio never stops, and we are all used to the constant chatter. This is my account of what happened next, and what ended my career in the LAPD. Radio SC1 welfare check requested for 1630 Richmond. Neighbors report screaming coming from next door. Attempted contact without success. 1805 radio. I'll be responding. Put it in my stack. I wasn't far away, thankfully. I had been mindlessly driving up and down my district for what seemed like forever without a call. Like I said, it was rare not to get bombarded without calls on a daily basis on a major drinking holiday at that. After dispatch woke my butt up, I was for the first time excited to take this one. Just two right turns and I was there. Stepping out of my car, I was struck by how dark the night was. I don't know why. LA is usually bright even at night with all the lights and smog. I could still make out these shadows of the mighty palm trees littering the sky. One of the reasons I moved out here. I cautiously made my way to the residence, which I did on every call. There are no routine calls, especially in South Central. 1805 radio, show me at the stop. Code 6 for open door, request an additional unit for entry. 1805 request an additional unit for open door, unit to identify. 1809. 1805, identify, copy direct. I'll be at the southwest corner of Richmond and Kelly. 1809, copy that. After my partner arrived, we approached the residence. The home was devoid of all light. I had never seen a home this dark before. I know that it was late, but it was still strange. I made the front door, announcing myself as a police officer. Approaching a door is always dicey, but approaching an open door brings with it an entire new set of issues. 
I looked toward my partner, a guy that I didn't know all that well, but knew that he was a good cop. We nodded and made our way inside. LAPD, if there's anyone in there, identify yourself. Silence. We moved closer into the front hallway, toward what looked like a living room to our right, and a bathroom and maybe a bedroom further down the hallway. LAPD, we're looking for her. Oh, I forgot who the homeowner was. I had to quickly look at my hand where I had wrote the info down. Mary Smith, husband Scott, said not home in three days, screaming heard. Anyone that is a cop or married to a cop is used to them coming home with novels scribbled all over their last dominant hand. Just the easiest way to do it, I guess we've all found. Mary, Scott, listen to the sound of my voice. We're from the LAPD. Please, come out if you're here. We're here to help you. I started moving through every room in the house, using my department-issued Enforce flashlight attached to my G19. I would rather be ready than have to get ready. Going through dark room after dark room starts to make me more nervous than usual. I'm not an architect, but it didn't seem from the approach on the outside that this house had this many rooms. Two bedrooms at best. Maybe one bath and one half bath. This area of LA is so compact that there isn't room for much else. Crap. One step. Crashing down to the floor below. My vision blurs and my focus changes to a lit up open space. Panting and getting up off my knees. I make sure that I'm okay and I get to my feet. 1905 radio. It looks like there's a trap door in the back of this house. It advised to watch footing. What the heck is this? It's like an underground bunker, but also like an office. I'm walking on what feels like a soggy yellow carpet. And the walls have an odd 1970s yellow tint. Before, there was nothing but silence. But now I can hear the distinctive hum of fluorescent lighting overhead. Gun drawn, I'm still clearing every corner. Slowly making my way around every half wall and barrier. 1805, anybody copy? Crap. 1805, does anyone read? Now I found myself in an even bigger room. It's empty. And moving to my right, I'm in another hallway. A long hallway. I start running, panic setting in. But I won't let that enter my brain just yet. I'll use it to move my body, but I must keep my mind sane right now. I don't know what this is, but there has to be a way out. Police department, anyone in here? After moving from room to room, and room to room, and room to room, I see one with a piece of cardboard on the ground. Next to it are two garbage bags. I'm not going to see what's inside, but I'm relieved to see some sign of life at least. Moving closer to the cardboard, I see that there's some kind of blanket on top. Okay. Turning around now, there's something shining in the distance, not too far away. Picking up the pace towards the light, which I hoped was someone shining me for help. I see it's just the glistening of a damp wall. What the? This place is leaking. Why is it so damp down here? After I left the trash room, I could see another object not far from me. The closer I got, it looked like a recliner chair. As I was only a few feet from it, I see that I'm looking through a window. The first window in this place. Okay. I tried to go around the wall to find the room, but you guessed it. No success. I can hear a low roaring. What the? Hello? Moving quickly to my left and right, still with my handgun drawn. I try to control my breathing. No amount of training prepared me for this. I heard one quiet moan, and then silence. I ran in the only direction that I could, just to get away from whatever thing I was near. Stopping to catch my breath, I picked up my head to see a half door, like a doggy door but for humans. The roaring got louder. I went prone and belly crawled as fast as I could down that hallway. 
It felt like I was John McClane. I wouldn't do any yippee ki tonight, though. I was sure. Ahead of me, after crawling for what felt like an hour, was a red fan. Finally approaching it, I saw that thankfully there was another path to the left. One that I could crouch walk in. Moving for so long, going in and out of hallways, hitting dead ends. I'm getting tired. I thought that I was out and then I hit a complete barrier. I'm pretty much giving up now. I turned around and fell to where I began in the first yellow room. Messy one. You've been here before. Oh great, radio's back. Thank you lord. Who is this? Can you hear me? You've seen this all before. You've seen all of this before. You've seen this before. You have to keep going. Who is this? Where am I? Who are you? What is this? Messy one. No one will find you in here. Nobody. You have to keep going. To keep going. Like a madman, I just started sprinting. I was done with this. I didn't care what happened next. I just wanted to get out of here. I ran through every room in this godforsaken place. I fell into a big open room. Looking up, I saw approximately 24 people staring at me from behind the wall. I immediately drew my sidearm again, aiming it at, well, all of them I guess, sweeping back and forth. And getting my head straight again, I realized they were targets like at a gun range. I slowly made my way towards them. They were paper but sitting. I can't make sense of it, and I'm done trying to make sense of this demon world. When I turned around, I was in a level that looked like the old Doom game. Crude, red, and bi-level. I kept walking. I walked to the arena. I was the main attraction. I was surrounded by thousands of emotionless, faceless, and computer-generated spectators. They didn't move. They didn't make a move. I steadfastly made my way through the arena, towards an opening ahead of me. You have to keep going. Keep going. You have to go. You have to keep going. Yeah, I heard you, buddy. At this point, I'm just trying to stay strong so my brain doesn't melt and seeing all this unspeakable horror around me. More of the yellow wallpaper. You like to play video games. What? Not really. Do you like to play video games? Somehow... Lying found you, but it wasn't good enough for you. You went to change it and make it yours. It wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. You made it your own. Is that what you wanted? Can you just... Can you just tell me how to get out of here? I don't even know who or what you are. And I don't think you know who I am. Please. I hope you learned your lesson. Goodbye. Blackness fades in, and I'm back at the start again. The yellow half walls and the annoying sound of the fluorescent lights. I catch my breath. I am defeated. I slowly take my last few steps around this place. I go left. I go right. It's never ending. It's never changing. When, behind an opening in the distance, a dark figure appears. Even from far away, I can see that it reaches the ceiling. It's lean, grotesque, and makes horrifying, siren-like noises from its disgusting mouth. By habit, I draw down on this horror, knowing that it's no use. 
it instantly charges. I don't bother firing around. I run as fast as I can. I think that I dropped my gun. I don't know. I went through hallways, dipped into rooms. However, I could keep going. I did. I finally reached the end. I fell hard and that was it. Total darkness. I see one beam of light on the ground and another approaching me. It's a flashlight. Rick, where the heck have you been? That was the last thing I remember before waking up at St. Mary's. I had minor physical injuries, but the department thought that I needed to get my head checked. Both Mary and Scott Smith have been missing for some time now. The whereabouts of both remain unknown. The screaming has never been accounted for. Nothing has been accounted for. During the full investigation after our incident, an extensive search was done of the house on Richmond Street in the daytime, and the hidden door was never found. I don't know what writing this down is going to do. I put this all over the place. I can't conclude this with any kind of meaningful message or any kind of cautionary tale. Not like I lived through a weird camping incident or a paranormal experience. I can't say don't camp in the woods of whatever place, or if you hear whistling in the Rockies, turn around or some dumb stuff. I wish it was easy as, if you find yourselves in the back rooms, don't. I guess it's only beneficial for me to write this, to write it down in black and white to make it real. I hope and pray that no one else goes through this. I am fortunate to survive. Please, be safe, my friends. Please, survive. My brother used to come into my room to cover my ears at night. Written by Girl from the Crypt. When you're holding somebody's ears shut, you can't cover up your own. I didn't realize that for a long time. I'm writing this to get it out of my system, off my chest, so to speak. It's a Hail Mary effort, for sure, but maybe I'll get some good advice out of this. My big brother, Bron, used to come into my room late at night when I was little. The visit seemed random, but what happened at least once every three months. I was and still am a very light sleeper, so I would wake up instantly whenever he would open the door. He would place his finger over his lips before sitting down on the bed with me. Then, he would pull me close and place his hands over both of my ears. We would sit like this for around an hour each time before he would eventually let go of me and go back to his own room. I tried to ask him why he kept doing this, but he never told me directly. The older I got, however, the more everything appeared to fall into place. There was only one rational explanation, and that it had to have been related to my parents. Mom and Dad were a seemingly happy couple, they never fought, argued, or even swore in front of my older brother and me. But maybe that's what they were doing at night. And that's what Bron didn't want me to hear. So, I started looking for signs, I suppose. Tension between my parents when us kids weren't in the same room with them. Well-hidden bruises. Broken objects around the house. Many kinds of marks a physical altercation could have left. I was spying on them every free minute of my day, but I found nothing. All was perfectly fine and normal. Obviously, I was glad mom and dad actually did get along as well as they made it seem. But with that possibility ruled out, the mystery of Bron's visit remained unexplained. I could have just asked Bron what he was doing, but that's not really how a kid's mind works. Or at least, it wasn't how my mind worked. The way I saw it, I had to make an effort to figure this out on my own. 
like all those clever young detective nerds on TV, I really did feel a little like an investigator or a secret agent of sorts. That's a childhood innocence for you. For a long time, my search for answers yielded no results. I never quit and gave up on it though. Over the years, yes, this went on for years. I got better at sneaking around the house unnoticed. I learned how to walk without making any sound whatsoever. I would creep up to Bron's bedroom late at night, sometimes and peek through the keyhole. From what little I could tell by watching him, he never got up to anything suspicious either. So, if it wasn't mom and dad fighting, and if Bron wasn't being crazy, what was going on? By the way, Bron and I are roughly three years apart. I don't know when I started investigating, but I do know how old I was when I finally found out. Eleven. I was eleven years old and Bron was fourteen. During that time, I had taken a new approach to the whole matter. I was aware Bron would visit me every other month, which meant that on these special nights, something happened in our house or at least in earshot of it. Bron obviously knew and had kept it from me very successfully thus far. However, if I were to get a head start on him, I might have a chance of finding out. All I would have to do was hide somewhere around the house, somewhere outside my room where Bron wouldn't find me. Of course, I didn't know where this weird mystery thing would be transpiring, so I had to pick hiding spots at random and just hope that I would be lucky enough to get a good view. If not, I knew that I would at least hear it. The downside of this plan was that, since Bron's visits didn't come at a set schedule, I would have to hide every single night and just wait for something to happen. And worse yet, I needed to be extremely cautious. If I got caught once, my entire mission might end up being compromised. If Bron knew that I was onto him, he would probably lock me up in my room from then on or something. Either way, there were two hiding spots that I deemed suitable. I decided to switch between them every night to maximize my chances of witnessing the event. One was the cupboard underneath the kitchen sink. I've always been flexible so even as a lanky 11 year old, I could fit myself in there without any difficulties. Then. I would simply keep the door open a crack and appear outside. From there, I had an excellent view of the kitchen and half of the dining room. The other spot was on top of the tall closet in the upstairs hallway. This lovely piece of old furniture was placed facing the staircase that led up to our bedrooms from the living room downstairs. It was where we stored all of our blankets bed sheets and towels so that any one of us could simply walk out from the room or the bathroom to take what they needed. Very accessible. The good thing was that there would always be blankets lying on top of the closet too. So if I hid underneath those, I would have a good view of almost the entire living room as well as the front door. On top of that, with a bit of quiet maneuvering, I would be able to tell what was going on in the hallway as well. The only thing I couldn't see at all was the kitchen and the dining room. I switched between those two spots every night. I'd be extremely sneaky about it. I would wait for Bron to come by and say goodnight like he always did, and wait until he returned to the living room. He would usually stay up much longer than me and watch TV downstairs with my parents. Once I was sure nobody was paying attention, I would either crawl down the stairs and into the kitchen cabinet on all fours, or go out into the hallway where I would use the smaller chest of drawers beside the big closet as a sort of a stepladder to then hide under the blankets on top of it. In the meantime, I had also acquired the key to my room, and I would lock it from the outside as soon as I would leave for my hiding place. With that, I risk not being able to make a fast and silent return to my bed when in need, but it would also buy me time when Brian would inevitably come to cover my ears one of these nights. 
Surely, he would think that I had locked myself in because I wanted privacy. And his first course of action would be to find a way into my room. Instead of assuming that I was somewhere else in the house and going around to look for me. So you see, I was very calculative in the way that I went about my plan. And then, the night came and it finally happened. I was hiding on top of the closet. I'm not sure if I should be lucky if I did. On the one hand, if I had been hiding in the kitchen, I would have seen little of what went down. But on the other hand, I really wish that I hadn't seen half of what went down. It started with me waiting for what felt like hours. Maybe it really was hours, who knows. I could hear the TV humming away downstairs, but nobody was talking. Kind of odd. Suddenly, I heard the front door being unlocked. In came my mother wearing high heels, a short red dress, and eye-catching hoop earrings. I had never seen her dressed up like that, and I hadn't even known that she was going out that night. She was laughing loudly, her bright red lipstick shining as she switched on the light in the hallway. She wasn't alone. A man followed her inside. He was about the same age as her, dressed in a nice gray suit. I had never seen him before, but he was holding her hand. She pulled him into the hallway after her. He was laughing as well, and I could tell that he was drunk. Mom shut the door behind them, smiling wildly at the stranger. The TV was switched off. Dad and Bron emerged from the back of the living room, making their way into the hallway. The stranger, who was just taking off his coat, halted. Turning to my mother, he slurred. Hey, uh, I thought you'd be alone. She gave him a sweet grin and shrugged before turning and pressing herself up against the door, locking it behind her back. What? Was all a man could say before a dad wrapped his arm around him from behind and pressed his hand over his mouth. He was holding something white, like a handkerchief maybe. He stuffed it into the guy's mouth. The stranger tried to reach up and remove dad's arm, but my father didn't let go. I stared at them in shock, unable to move. This wasn't really happening, was it? Hey, just stay still now, buddy. Dad said in a calm voice. The stranger whimpered through the gag and slowly lowered his arms. Ron, go take care of your sister. My older brother, who had been watching these scene with mild interest, nodded and proceeded to climb the staircase. I lowered my head, allowing the blanket that I had been peeking out from to swallow me whole. Bron's footsteps moved up the stairs and towards my bedroom door. I heard him press down on the handle to find that the door remained in place. My brother gave a low hum as he tried it again, and then again and again. The handle creaked quietly in protest. I shifted on top of the closet and I peered out to the side. As expected, Bron was standing outside my room, a look of alarmed confusion on his face. He raised his hand and ever so gently knocked on my door. April, he uttered. April, are you asleep? No response came from the empty room. April... He repeated in a low voice. Can I come in, please? Still nothing, of course. I stayed as silent as I could, hidden safely beneath the sheets. Meanwhile, the stranger was weeping quietly downstairs, his voice muffled by the gag Dad had put into his mouth. My parents were staying still, like they were listening in on what was happening upstairs. After some thinking... Bron raised his fist and banged it against the door with such force, the whole floor seemed to shake. I winced. My older brother then leaned against the door, pressing his ear to it. After a few seconds, he shook his head and went back downstairs. She's locked herself in. She seems to be asleep in there, though. Well, it was to be expected, Mom muttered. Girls want their privacy. We couldn't have made you keep barging in there anyways. We're gonna have to talk to her soon. I turned to my spot to look down into the living room again. What did she mean? 
They were going to talk to me soon. Were they planning on letting me in on whatever his sick scheme this was? Bron seemed to know all right. I still didn't want to believe my eyes. Maybe I thought maybe this was all just to set up. They had seen me sneak around and this was my punishment. Maybe this guy was just an actor. Part of me was tempted to simply come out of my hiding spot and tell them that I had learned my lesson. But I wasn't actually naive enough to think that was the truth. I knew very well what was happening. Deep down, I knew. I just didn't have the strength to accept it. My disbelief was protecting me from the cruelty I was in the process of witnessing. What do we do with this one? Brana asked, pointing at the man restrained by my father's arms. What we normally do, Dad replied. Just quieter. With that, he grabbed the stranger by the neck and slammed his head down against the banister. It collided with a loud thump. I pressed my hand over my mouth. The man's head left a red stain on the wood, and his body fell limp, folding over the staircase. Dad picked him up and proceeded to drag him off into the part of the living room that I couldn't see. Mom smiled at Bron and patted his shoulder. Sweetie, can you wipe that off for me? Come join us when you're done. My brother nodded and while mom walked after dad, he went into the kitchen. He returned with a wet cleaning rag and started to work on the stain. Afterwards, he made his way back to our parents. I had no idea where they had gone exactly, but I figured it was the basement. They had probably exited through the back door. Once everything was silent, I slid off the closet and went back into my room. I lay down in bed and I stayed there until morning, despite being wide awake. I didn't run for the police or a neighbor. I didn't tell anyone a thing. In fact, I didn't talk at all. I would not open my mouth to utter a single word for four entire weeks after that night. At school, I didn't participate. I didn't talk to my friends or my brother or my parents. It was obvious to my family that something was wrong, and they would try to get me to tell them, but I stayed quiet. I don't know why exactly I didn't speak. Sometimes I actually wanted to, but when I would open my mouth, my mind would suddenly empty, and it felt like I had completely forgotten every word that had ever existed. That entire time, I knew that I had to tell somebody, but I didn't know how. I was scared that the police wouldn't take me seriously. I figured maybe I could turn to a teacher first, but I was afraid they wouldn't believe me and they would tell my parents. Four weeks later, the police were at our door. I hadn't been the one to inform them and I felt terrible about it, but I couldn't have been happier. I saw them from my window as their cars pulled up outside of our house. I started to cry then. I knew that I should have said something sooner and at the time, the guilt was killing me. With every day that I had kept my mouth shut, I had been scared that they would bring home another one, that someone else was going to die, and that it would be my fault for not doing anything. They didn't get anyone else before they were caught though. It was over and I was so happy. I'm not sure how exactly the police or whoever was on it at the time found out my parents were the ones that were responsible for 23 disappearances, and not just around town either. They lured in both men and women, killed them, and took all of their cash and belongings. Those were just the ones that they had definitive proof of, but I genuinely hope that was all. Bron and I grew up apart from our mother and father. After what I had seen, I didn't mind too much. Ever since that night, I had been scared to death of them. Quite literally, seeing as I had been walking on eggshells in fear of what they would do to me if they found me out or I upset them. Bron was and never punished for helping them or anything. I'm not even sure if they knew we did so at all. We both got to counseling and stuff though. It was a really difficult time for me, for both of us. So I'm sorry for not wanting to talk about it any more than this. I hope you understand. Either way, 
I already mentioned him writing this because of something that happened recently. It took a long time for Bron and me to reestablish somewhat of a trusting relationship. I realized that he had been greatly impacted by the things that he had seen. I don't know when mom and dad started using him to assist them, but I was certain he had been like me, a scared child who hadn't known what else to do. Maybe it had started with them simply telling him to cover my ears, and he had investigated them himself, only to find out about the killings, and then mom and dad had sucked him in. I had been afraid of him too for a long time actually, but that's how we slowly started talking again. Nowadays, we're very close, or at least, we were until yesterday. Bron and I had met up for lunch. We got ourselves takeout and ate at his place, since that gave us the chance to catch up in private. And that's when he made a suggestion. You're really pretty these days. He began, giving me a once-over. You look a lot like mom. Maybe even better than her, actually. Um, where are you going with this? I asked, uncertain and a little uncomfortable with being compared to my mother. You ever think about how mom and dad got caught? Honestly, I don't want to think about them at all. Oh, of course, but I was wondering. You know how they did it, right? She lured them in and dad would do this whole ambushing thing. He paused, tilting his head. You don't make as much as you should, and neither do I. And work sucks. And there's people who really have more money on them every day than we make in a month. And most of the time, those are awful people. He said this so casually it sounded like he was telling me about the weather forecast. I didn't say anything. I simply got up and walked out of the door, not stopping to put on my coat. I simply took it outside with me. That was yesterday and we haven't spoken since. I don't know what to do. Ever since then, I've been asking myself if he had played a bigger role in all of this. The thought itself seems outlandish, but the more I wonder, the more I feel like there might be something to it. If anyone who reads this has any idea on what course of action to take here, please share it with me. I'm at a loss and I'm scared. There's this one thing I keep thinking about in particular. I mentioned it at the start of the post, too. Bron would only ever hold my ears shut, meaning he himself would hear everything. I never noticed him showing any kind of distress at it, though. Everyone in my village keeps to themselves. The new neighbors broke that rule. Written by Weird Bryce Guy. I don't usually go out of my way to introduce myself to new neighbors. I've lived in my subdivision for 10 years, and I've only formally met one of the four families that have moved into houses on my street. The other houses are occupied by families and single owners who have lived there for as long as I have. There is an unspoken agreement to leave each other alone. We all, for reasons that assuredly vary, greatly value our privacy. When the Kern stocks moved in across the street, I was, as usual, avoidant. I didn't go out and greet them during their day-long rental truck unload. I did not make myself seen on my lawn or in my garage while they rested on and in theirs. I did not offer assistance when the father struggled to unload a large couch while the mother and child carried in smaller boxes. I had nothing against these people, key tents being had, but I also had no incentive to help them. I respect the rule of the neighborhood. I depend on it. People around here leave each other alone. The day of their arrival passed without incident, that is, without interaction. I successfully made myself scarce when necessary, and they never ventured across the street to introduce themselves. Likewise, the other homes throughout the neighborhood remained shut and quiet, as if they were unoccupied. The Kernstocks 
whose name I learned by a novelty sign affixed to their mailbox, seemed from a distance like normal, nice people. But you should never judge a book by its cover, or a child by its feigned innocence. I went to sleep that first night, thinking that the current stocks would do well in the neighborhood. When I awoke the next morning to find their child standing on my front porch, I immediately reevaluated that thought. I had gone out to grab yesterday's mail, which I had temporarily forsaken so as to avoid being seen, and upon opening my door, I came to find a four foot eight human being standing barefoot on my welcome mat. I did not know why I owned a welcome mat. The child was dressed in a nightwear befitting someone his age, pajamas bearing designs of some video game or cartoon character. His hair attested to the appearance of having just woken up. The brown locks matted on one side of his head and wildly sticking out from the other. But the child's eyes bellied this false appearance. They were eerily aware, a light with a vitality which was plainly beyond childish excitement, wonder, or even long-awaited mischief. They were the eyes of a focused, sophisticated mind on the verge of enacting some sinister plot. I was immediately uncomfortably sure of this fact, as silly as it may seem. I greeted the child with a voice that, looking back, probably sounded meek, if not actually frightened. I had never felt so spontaneously disconcerted, and the fact that the child had somehow elicited the feeling made it even worse. The kid looked up at me and pointed, his stubby little finger aiming past my head and into my house. I half turned, cocking my head in the direction but keeping my eyes on him, not wanting to completely remove him from my sight. I asked him what he was pointing at, and rather than smile and say something creepy like I would come to expect in that bizarre moment, he instead said, That is your territory and then pointed back at his house, continued, And this is mine. You have your secrets, we have ours. We can coexist peacefully if we stay out of each other's way. Do you understand? There is no sly smile to indicate that he had been joking, no cuteness about his demeanor. He was in that terribly tense moment, completely serious. I nodded, incapable of mustering up the air necessary for speech. The child nodded, and ambled back toward his house. I watched him enter the street, heedless of potential traffic, then shut the door, not bothering to retrieve my mail. Any joy that would have been possible for that morning was stripped away by the encounter with the Kernstock boy. I stayed inside, though not because I wanted to. The neighborhood was quiet and antisocial, but we all had lives, jobs, and hobbies, things which frequently took us away from our homes. I had wanted to go to the bookstore for a volume of manga and a cookie at the cafe, but instead I stayed inside and mostly just stared, or ascended and descended the stairs without any real reason. I looked out a window once, peered through the vertical curtain slit of the window in my bedroom. In that brief glimpse of the outside world, I saw something bizarre, nearly beyond belief. The Kernstock boy, sometime during the hours since our unsettling encounter, had grown, had advanced in age by several years, becoming a young man in his mid-teens. There is no doubt that this was the same child who had only hours ago essentially told me to stay away from him and his family. His hair was the same, and I had seen no other child during the previous day's move. But even if I didn't notice the hair, or had doubts about the total number of occupants of the home, I would have nonetheless known right away that this was the same person. Because the eyes... Those eerily animate eyes 
snapped at me during my brief peek through the curtains. I quickly withdrew from the window and ran into the master bathroom like a dog who had just been scared by a suddenly activated vacuum. I literally panicked, had a full-blown episode of anxiety and terror, all because of that kid, that teen that had looked at me from across the street. I stayed in the bathroom for a few minutes until my breathing calmed down and my heart steadied. I hadn't bothered to turn the light on. Knew that seeing my pathetically frightened state in the mirror would only worsen things. Eventually, after regaining enough composure to at least pretend that I was a rational, mature adult, I left the bathroom and went downstairs to make some coffee. Thankfully, I had rarely depended on the stairs railing for ascending and descending the steps during my tenure occupancy of the house. Halfway down, a belated realization caused me to misstep and nearly fall forward, but my hand instinctively grabbed the railing, and it supported my body weight without giving. Hanging there, desperately clutching the railing as if there is a pit of acid below me and not a tiled floor. I replayed the brief image of my glimpse through the curtains in my mind, and shuddered at the recollection. I was unprecedentedly unsettled by the horrible suggestions. I realized then that I was not dealing with some evil child who, unbeknownst to his parents, could change his form and do other wickedly preternatural things. It wasn't until I had gone to the stairs that my brain registered the other person in the short glimpse. The child, the hastily grown teen, had been helping his father carry in groceries. His parents were aware of his exponential growth. And despite these surreal circumstances, there was nothing that I could actually do. Nothing I wanted to do regarding the miracle kid. Like with most things that are, compared to our regular lives, amazing or even terrifying, it eventually lost its flair as the hours went by and the priorities of my own life had reintroduced themselves. I went about my day, consciously focusing on chores and hobbies, while subconsciously burying the unexplainable observation beneath the usual mound of mundane fears, insecurities, worries, and song lyrics. The next day, Saturday, I was allowed a pleasant morning, a satisfying lunch and the beginnings of a comfy afternoon, before my life was threatened by you-know-who. I had made the mistake of answering my door before looking through my people. I rarely had the need to use the aperture, since even the delivery man of insert service knew not to bother without knocking, knew that I, along with everyone else in the neighborhood, preferred to have packages and foods left on the porch. Payment pre-made through an app, a website, or a phone call. When I opened the door, I came to find a familiar face, though one that was thankfully not the result of accelerated aging. It was the father, Mr. Kernstock, who smiled at me warmly upon making eye contact. He asked me if I wouldn't mind taking a picture of him and his family standing in front of their new house. Somewhat dumbfounded by the boldness of this man, boldness compared to the reclusiveness of everyone else, I delayed in responding. Nandy took this as acquiescence to his request. He gently placed a camera in my hands, which I must have automatically stupidly raised, and told me how neither of his immediate neighbors had answered their doors. I smiled and tried to refrain from crushing his dinky little camera. I followed Mr. Kernstock across the street, and it didn't occur to me that I had made a horrible, life-threatening mistake until he came outside, along with his mother. The teen had, of course, aged again, though the unnatural leap through the years had not been as excessive. He had aged two or three years, rather than six or seven. Now a young man of sixteen or seventeen, his eyes cryptically vibrant, seemed a bit more appropriate for his body. But even the unrepentantly mischievous, often cruel eyes of a suburban teen typically held within their core some spark of innocence, some capacity for redemption through maturation. These eyes were totally, balefully wicked, 
carried within their gaze an expression of conjugating evil. And when they rested on me, standing on the sidewalk with the camera in my hands, I remembered the boy's words. We can coexist peacefully if we stay out of each other's way. Do you understand? The father gathered his wife and son by his side at the edge of the lawn, instructed them to smile, and then nodded for me to take the picture. I aimed the camera, repositioned myself, and adjusted the camera's focus for the optimal shot, and then took the picture. But the father did not retrieve the camera, was not given the opportunity to approach me first. The son reached out and took the camera from my hands without even introducing himself to me. As far as I knew, his parents had been unaware of his earlier visit. Before turning to walk away, he whispered, I told you to stay away from us, and now you've involved yourselves in our lives. He returned to his lawn, handing the camera to his father as he passed by. Mr. Kernstock examined the photo and complimented me on my amateur photography skills. I was just about to turn and leave when the son paused midway through his front lawn, turned back to me and said, No, oh, by the way, now that you've captured me on film, I'll have to restart this whole thing. I can usually make it to adulthood, but a picture is evidence, and well, I can't have mom and dad catching on too early. It spoils the fun. The son, that unnaturally developed freak, snapped his fingers and his mother's skull exploded. Skull fragments and bits of brain scattered like shrapnel, and her limp body fell sideways onto the driveway. I froze, immediately rendered immobile by the shock of the unforeseen violence. Mr. Kernstock continued to admire the picture even though pieces of his wife's scalp had landed on his shoulder. I managed to stammer out something unintelligible, which got his attention, but he only waved a hand and reaffirmed his opinion that it was a really great photo. The son formed a finger gun with his hands, aimed it at his father and pulled the pretend trigger. Mr. Kernstock's chest exploded, showering the driveway with red, and he fell to the ground still gripping the camera, his face still frozen in expression of satisfaction. Doubly traumatized, I glanced around, but knew that even if someone had been watching, they wouldn't come to my assistance, wouldn't dare leave their homes. With a power that was undeniably supernatural, the son lifted the parents and drew them into the home by means of some sort of effortless telekinesis. The bodily debris were left on the lawn and driveway, a grisly reminder of his atrocious feats. And then, in another show of his appalling power, he de-aged himself back to the state he had been in when he had first appeared on my front porch. Before returning to his home, he picked up a piece of flesh and flicked it at me. A sickeningly wet shred struck my face and stuck, but I was helplessly petrified. The peas wasn't removed. The son and the boy laughed in a perfectly normal, innocently childish way, and then snapped his fingers once more. This final feat threw me into darkness, a state of instant and deep sleep. When I awoke, it was a new day. I had slept roughly 16 hours. I unsteadily got out of bed hoping that the last couple of days, or at least the previous day, had been a terribly vivid nightmare. But when I went to the bathroom to relieve my bladder, my reflection in the mirror banished all hopeful thoughts from my mind and sent a boreal chill through my body. Stuck to my left cheek was a piece of dried human flesh. Stay Out of the Abandoned House in the Woods Written by J. Group I grew up in a small town, the sort of place where bad things aren't supposed to happen. That's what we like to tell ourselves anyways. But something terrible did happen, something I don't ever talk about, that I haven't shared with anyone since it occurred. 
Hallow's End has old roots. Lots of folklore and history surround this place. Ruins of old structures, churches and government buildings, and other ancient things lost to time dot the sprawling, forested landscape of our town. As children, grown-ups would occasionally tell us tales detailing the origins of these ruins. The stories were often steeped in magic, detailing horrifying events that didn't add up. Creatures coming from the wilderness at night, trials of a witch woman who would kidnap children and farmhands who were never again seen. It wasn't until later on in life that I realized most towns didn't have those types of stories. Those recollections were quite unique to our town. But still, as a kid, my favorite stories were always the scariest. The one about a sanctuary deep within the local forest caught the interest of everyone my age when we had heard about it. Temple of Doom had recently come out when we learned about the place from a speaker at school during a local history class. Most of us had never heard the story, and word spread like wildfire about the mysterious ruins in the forest that could no longer be found. Sinister things had happened there according to the friendly looking, bespeckled man who stood speaking in front of our class. A coven or a guild of some kind practiced their dark arts in that place, kept rituals and ceremonies that were hidden from the public eye. People had gone missing from the nearby village and a couple hundred years ago, a slew of questions began to arise about what exactly was happening at this temple of evil, which existed deep within the forest. The local townspeople had raided the sanctuary, invaded the dark temple, and put the inhabitants of the place to death in the most horrifying ways imaginable. Only the eldest and wisest among them, their leader, had escaped. Their identity was never known to the public. Ever since that day, the town had been cursed, at least according to that legend. This patch of forest where the ancient sanctuary had once stood was close to my house, and despite the terrifying stories, we would frequently play in those woods when I was a kid. My parents would warn us about playing in the forest after dark, say never to stay past sunset. During the daytime, we were free to explore. It was a wide stretch of woodland that seemed to go on forever, at least to our young eyes, and we managed to find new things within it every day. We built forts in the fallen trees and rode our bikes down these steep hills that lined the gullies and valleys within. We would sword fight each other with fallen branches, play with matches, and occasionally light fireworks. Essentially, all the dumb activities kids of that age do when left alone in the woods. It was our getaway, our own private, natural playground that extended for acres and acres. We rarely saw anyone else out there. One summer day, I was walking through to my friends, Brad and Tom, and we came across another kid who looked vaguely familiar from around town, but who I didn't know very well. He was walking along in the forest and looked kind of sad all by himself. Hey man, I said, trying to sound friendly. You okay? When he looked up, I could see that he had been crying and I felt even worse for him. Sorry, he said sniffling, wiping his nose with his sleeve and getting stretchy lengths of snot all over it. I... this is so dumb. I moved here a while ago and I still don't know anybody all my friends live a thousand miles away and I'm stuck here by myself. I put my hand on his shoulder reassuringly and asked him his name. Ned, he told me, wiping his eyes. Hey Ned, I'm Jordan and this is Brad and Tom. We can be your friends, how about that? Simple enough, right? I looked over and Brad and Tom weren't objecting. I could tell that they felt bad for the kid too. For real? Yeah, man, no worries. Well, what were you guys doing? You mind if I tag along? We told him that we had planned to go look for the lost ruins of the ancient temple in the forest. It was early on a Saturday morning and we had the whole day ahead of us. But we had no idea where to start looking. Only knowing that it was somewhere within the woods where we were. 
Well, actually, I might be able to help, said Ned. My mom is a history nerd and I asked her about it after school yesterday. She told me it was to the west, probably over that hill I would say. Wow, thanks dude. It's a good thing you're here. You can be our navigator, okay? We set off enthusiastically, our pace quick, almost running at first. But then our legs grew tired and we began to slow our pace. After walking for an hour or more, the four of us decided to take a rest. We had come across a thickly overgrown section of the brush and wanted to stop for a while before going any deeper. I was starting to get tired of walking and was considering saying that we should stop for the day when Ned spoke up. Do you guys see that? It's like a reflection. I turned and saw the glint in the distance immediately. What is that? Brad asked. I have no idea. We got up and started walking through the dense shrubbery towards the reflection. It was so dark in the trees that it was hard to see. Difficult to move in the thick overgrowth, but we pushed through. The branches seemed to grab at my clothing and I had to fight hard against them to get past. There were thorn bushes which tore my skin, and the barbs went into my face like fish hooks, refusing to come out nicely. I twisted and turned my head to try and get the thorns out of my skin, my hands trapped at my sides. Eventually, I managed to free myself, ripping and tearing my face and arms to bloody shreds in the process. I looked around and saw that I was scratched and red with blood, but I managed to get out of the thorns and thistles and I pushed through, finally coming out into an opening. Tom and Brad made their way out of the forest next and stumbled out looking even more worse for wear than I did, bloodied and scratched by the thorns. They were trembling and out of breath, panting with exertion. Wow, that was pretty gnarly. Yeah, no kidding. Ned came through next, his skinny body twisting and angling itself to come through the thorn bushes without much visible damage, only a few cuts. He fixed his glasses and combed back his hair with his hands and joined us in the clearing. I looked up and saw what had been reflecting the light at us through the trees. It was the window of an old house. The place wasn't a simple cottage or a shack in the woods either. It was a house. Run down and ugly looking. The roof sagging down to the middle but a house nonetheless. And the siding had been painted red at some point in the past, I had guessed. But had taken on a dusty, dingy brown shade after years of neglect. Several of the windows were broken, but others remained intact. Shutters were hanging loose and askew, and the whole place had a haunted, lonely vibe to it that I didn't like very much. Whoa, there's a house out there? Who the heck builds a house in the middle of the forest? I couldn't answer that question, but guessed that it was someone who really wanted to be left alone. Shivers ran down my spine thinking about that, and I began to feel more and more afraid. It would take a very committed hermit to craft a retreat like this. The place was as secluded as it gets. Guys, maybe we should go. You never know, there could still be someone living in there. The three of us stared at the entrance and I noticed the door was ajar. It was hanging open invitingly, swaying in the breeze as if it were waving and beckoning us to come in. Nobody lives here, dude. It's abandoned. Just look at it. Brad started walking the short distance towards the house, and I felt a queasiness brewing in the pit of my stomach as I followed after him. When we got to the doorway, Brad hesitated, but only for a second, before stepping inside the echoing, empty building. Tom went in next, and then Ned and I followed hesitantly after, feeling more afraid of being left alone than going inside at that point. The wooden floors creaked and squeaked beneath our feet as we went into the dark, dusty old house. It was quiet inside, except for the echoing sounds of our footsteps. Empty aside from a few things. An old cast iron frying pan which was rusted and covered in dust, and spider webs had been left on the floor. We went deeper into the dark, dilapidated old house, to find a living area on the main floor. An old newspaper was scattered on the rug, Parts of it laying open on a busted, hole-covered couch, as if someone had just been reading it. 
but the yellowed paper looked decades old. There were a few other pieces of ancient, broken furniture, haphazardly tipped over on their sides. A filthy, broken mirror, but nothing that suggested anyone might actually still live there. I turned around and jumped, startled at the sight of someone standing in one of the dark corners of the room watching us. A person dressed entirely in black, their pale, wrinkled face only barely visible in the shadows. I screamed, pointing at the corner where the thing stood watching, but then realized it was only an old coat stand with a wrinkled white hat on it. Brad, Ned, and Tom had a good laugh at that one. When we started backtracking towards the main entrance and saw that there were a couple of closed doors off the main hallway. The first one was located next to the front door. Brad, the daredevil that he was, decided he would open it. I watched as he twisted the knob slowly and carefully, opening the door to reveal a small, darkened space. It appeared empty aside from an old broom and some wire hangers. Boring, said Brad. I didn't share his sentiment. This whole place felt off. It was making the hair stand up on the back of my neck and it was making me feel nauseous, cold and sweaty all at the same time. Ned walked over to the other door. He took a deep breath and raised a trembling hand to open it. The darkness was gradually flooded with dim light as he pushed open the wooden door, its rusted hinges squealing. Just an old bathroom, said Ned looking inside. You guys want to go check out the upstairs? Hey, hang on, what's that? Tom asked, eyeing the wall at the far end of the darkened room. We all crowded around to look and saw immediately what he had noticed. A piece of vermilion fabric was showing from beneath the baseboard near the bathtub. What the heck? Brad marched in and pulled on the fabric to pick it up. It stuck. That was when I noticed the long, rounded black marks on the floor. Um, guys, I think this wall might not actually be a wall. They all looked at me and followed my gaze down to the marks on the floor, barely visible in the darkness. Whoa, okay, now things are getting creepy. Is this a secret passage or something? Only one way to find out. Come on, let's try to get it open. We spent the next few minutes pulling on various fixtures and getting grossed out when cockroaches and mice would occasionally scamper and skitter around us and on us, but eventually someone figured it out. It must have been Ned. He pulled on the chain which was connected to the plug in the bathroom sink, and surprisingly, a sound began like gears ticking. The entire wall began to swing in towards us and we had to take a step back to let it open. The well-hidden, secret doorway revealed an ancient looking set of stairs, which went downwards for a long, long ways. The small amount of light quickly dissipated, and nothing could be seen below in that horrifying pit of darkness. Immediately, I lost any courage that I had left. This was beyond anything we were prepared for, but we had found what we were looking for. We were almost immediately sure of that. Hidden beneath this well-camouflaged house in the woods, existing against all common sense, were these subterranean ruins of the ancient sanctuary that we had learned about in history class. Check out those carvings on the walls, exclaimed Ned, remain behind us in the small space. We moved forward and saw that there were indeed carvings, elaborate reliefs and images hewn from the stone adorning the passageway leading downwards. The three of us crowded around the doorway, scared and excited, looking at the carvings. They showed terrible images, and I wondered immediately why anyone would want to make art depicting such bad things, such darkness. I guess my grandpa was right about the ruins being over in this direction. You guys want to go down and check it out? A tingling sensation was covering my entire body, goosebumps rising on my skin. Something about his voice wasn't quite right, and hadn't he said that it was his mom who was the history nerd? She was the only one who had told him in which direction the temple ruins lay, or was I mistaken? I, I thought it was your mom who said it was here. Oh, whoops, I heard Ned mutter quietly to himself, and got my stories mixed up. Ah, well, it doesn't matter. 
Suddenly, I felt him push me from behind with such force that I went stumbling forward into Brad and Tom. I'm off balance and unable to stop myself from falling over the precipice. The three of us tumbled violently and bone shatteringly downwards into the blackness below, crashing and bouncing against the hard rock and its sharp edges. Eventually, we had reached the floor down below, careening into the wall opposite the stairs with such force that it felt as if my jaw had shattered. My ears were ringing and I immediately had an awful headache that pierced my brain like a spike through the temple. I was barely conscious and in such horrible agony that I barely registered the demented laughter coming from up above for a few long moments. Of course it was Ned. It had been him from the beginning. He had led us to this dark temple in the forest, just like the terrifying stories that we had heard in history class. I heard the murmur of echoing voices and footsteps approaching in the dark, and my heart began to pound with fear like never before. What had we gotten ourselves into? Have you ever trusted someone and gotten burned? Helped someone and had your kindness repaid with suffering? Well, then you can relate to how I was feeling when I woke up in the blackness beneath the abandoned house in the woods. The rough stone floor was cold beneath me, and I struggled to focus, my aching head swimming in the darkness. Had I lost consciousness for a brief second? Yes, it seemed as if I had. When we were in a house, I remember that, but this wasn't a house. It was a terrible, dark, cavernous dungeon sort of place that I didn't like at all. Not one bit. And the sound of footsteps drawing near made my heart jackhammer with fear, knowing immediately that they did not belong to someone friendly. There had been an abandoned house in the woods. We had gone inside, me, Brad, and Tom. Except there had been someone else with us. Ned. It all came flooding back to me in an instant, and with it came the pounding, incessant pain in my temples. I tried getting to my feet and fell backwards off balance. The footsteps were getting closer. I started to shake Brad and Tom, whispering to them, Get up, get up. Someone's coming. Tom grunted and looked like he was maybe going to wake up, but Brad just lay there looking pale and cold. He didn't make a sound. His breathing shallow and barely noticeable. The flame of a torch was getting closer, turning from a firefly into a candle wick in size, and I instinctively hid. I ran to the first concealed place that I could find, beneath these stone stairs just a few yards away, managing to wedge myself into the tight space, just before the approaching men were within range to see me. Looks like Nettie screwed up again said one of the men laughing. He kicked Tom with his shoe, and he groaned and blinked his eyes at Graggly, seeming not to understand what was happening. Nah, you'll get it one of these days. Give him a break, he's still a kid. Just get him upstairs to the pitfall. That's all he's got to do. Pull the dang lever when they're all in the bedroom, and he won't have to have these sorts of problems. He kicked Tom harder again. That's why we built the dang thing. Wouldn't have bothered if he was just going to keep shoving them down the stairs. Yep. At least this one's knocked out cold. There were three of them, all dressed in long, hooded, vermilion robes. The same color as the scrap of fabric we had found beneath the hidden door in the bathroom. It was all starting to come together, as I overheard them talking. Ned was the one who lured kids out into the forest to find the abandoned house. They were making people disappear in this place just like the stories we had heard about in history class. But we weren't supposed to see the hidden door in the bathroom, I surmised. The last thing he had said before we noticed the scrap of fabric and the scuff marks on the floor, indicating the secret passage was there, was that we should go check out the upstairs. So the real trap door, whatever it was, that dropped people down into this dungeon was actually up there, which meant the door we had come through had not been used for its intended purpose. Was that maybe the way these evil people got in and out of here? And if it was, maybe there was a latch or lever that would let me out. And perhaps there was hope for me after all, but I couldn't just leave my friends. As scared as I was, I needed to see what was going to happen to them, and if I could still save them. Besides, Ned was still up in the house for all I knew. 
He hadn't followed us and so had perhaps taken some other route down into the dungeon. There was also still the chance that he was up there waiting for us to try and escape. I couldn't take the chance. The terrible headache was making it difficult to think. I couldn't focus and only knew that I wanted to try and help my friends as terrified as I was. So when the three men picked up my friends and started to carry them away, I followed after at a distance. I felt as if I was unsafe no matter what I did, so my panicked mind instinctively wanted to stay with my friends and with the light. That's all I can say to justify it in retrospect. I wish I had just run and taken my chances up in the house against Ned though. I will never be able to unsee the things that happened after that. I followed the men, dragging my friends away, quickly realizing I would have to keep track of each turn, as the maze-like subterranean tunnel seemed to go on forever. To help myself get back, I left a penny from my pocket at each left or right, heads for left, tails for right. This place was ancient by the looks of it and more elaborate than anyone could have imagined. There were hieroglyphics and murals, symbols and colorful imagery painted on the walls, but it could barely be glimpsed in the darkness. I got the impression that there was once a great society living beneath the ground here, unknown and unmentioned in the history books. The torchlight flickered and dissipated up ahead, and I had to pick up the pace to keep up with the men, terrified of being left alone in the dark maze where I would no doubt roam lost forever. I realized when I heard Tom waking up and screaming that they were hurrying their pace because he was fighting and struggling with them. Suddenly, they turned a corner, and they were gone. I caught up and looked around the sharp rock wall to see a vast open chamber. There was a throne in a dais which was ornate and covered in dark purple and black jewels. Candlelit chandeliers hung suspended from the ceiling, and the huge room echoed within the movements of the hooded men. There was someone sitting upon the throne, dressed in a long, hooded, vermilion robe. Their faces were shrouded in darkness and they sat waiting, looking impatient. Two smaller thrones were set up on either side of this person, who I assumed was the leader of their group. You have done well once again. What have you brought us this time, servants of the many-legged god? Came a feminine voice from the center throne. Two young spirits, mother of mothers, we bring them to you so that you may mold them to your purposes, to the purpose of the Dark Temple. May they bring you many years of servitude, and may their spirits and wills be easily broken. The hooded woman on the throne in the center raised her long hand up, and summoned the men to come forward. They did, appearing cautious and afraid. Closer. They went closer. The mother of mothers, as the man had called her, did not seem pleased after all. She reached out and grabbed the man by the throat and the other two backed away, trembling. How exactly am I supposed to make a life-bonded servant of a dead boy? My heart stopped in my chest for a moment, hearing that. Brad had looked pale and his breathing had been shallow after the fall down the stairs. Maybe now it had stopped entirely. He had looked pretty rough after all. She continued to strangle the man with one strong hand, and I realized suddenly how tall she was. She towered over the men when she stood up, probably over seven feet. She released her grip for a few moments to let him speak. I'm sorry, mother. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. It was Ned. That boy is obstinate, but I will teach him. I will teach him to be better, I swear. I will make him understand. You peddle in excuses and lies, Simon. Take note for your next life. This is far less than the many-legged god deserves. The man began to scream in shrill cries of terror as he realized he was not going to get his way. She was done with him. No, we have been patient enough with you. You were told long ago to take responsibility for your charges. You have forsaken that responsibility. No, please, please, give me another chance. Don't do this. The woman was still holding him by the throat, tilting her head as she examined him. The man thrashed and bucked, trying to get away from her. The woman began to emit a low and melodious clicking sound. When the movie Predator came out a few years later, I remember jumping when I heard the sound the creature in that movie made.
because it was so similar. The other two women who had been seated in their thrones upon the dais began to emit this low clicking groan as well. The sound grew louder and louder, as the ground seemed to rumble and shake beneath my feet. I noticed then how the ornately carved stone walls had a large sewer grate sized holes in them, cleanly hollowed out and dark inside. From a few of these black holes came these shapes of creatures unlike anything I had seen before. They were huge, colorless millipedes with mouths full of sharp teeth. Their eyes glowed a pale blue shade, brimming with keen intelligence, but moreover, hunger. These creatures seemed to sniff the air and came down in weaving serpentine motions towards the man, still thrashing and screaming as the hooded woman held him by the neck. Their many legs skittered and clawed at the air. Tom was also fully awake now I could see. He was being held by the remaining two men and was fighting hard against them to get away. Seeing the unnatural creatures that were lurking in this dark underground temple of despair. More and more of the giant and millipede creatures were emerging from their holes. And they lunged at the hooded man and began to strike him in bloodthirsty attacks. Swarming him like a hive of snakes. Crimson fluid sprayed from his neck as they tore off his head and fought over it like hyenas, nipping and snapping at each other to gain the choicest morsels. All courage vanished from me as I saw this bewildering and terrifying scene occur before my eyes. Even at a distance, the worst of things obscured by darkness. I will never forget the things that I saw. I will have nightmares about them forever, especially knowing those carnivorous creatures still reside down there beneath my feet in the bowels of the town. Once the shed was over, the massive millipedes retreated back into their respective holes and I saw that Tom had been knocked unconscious by one of the two remaining men. He was a goner, I realized. There was no way that I could save him by myself. My best bet was to retreat and take my chances against Ned up in the house. I could try to get the authorities to come back and help, if anyone believed me. I turned around and saw Ned was standing just behind me, an unlit torch held in his hands which he looked about to swing at my head. Startled, I jumped back just as he had lunged at me swinging the torch. Luckily he missed and wound up stumbling forward off balance. Since I was larger than him, I managed to use his momentum against him and pushed him while spinning out of the way. It was probably the best thing that could have possibly happened, I guess, since I had caught him off guard by turning around just as he was fully committed to taking a swing at me. Ned missed completely and flew past me to wind up sprawled on the floor. I began to run immediately, knowing what was going to happen next. Surely enough, Ned began to scream for the other men to come and help, yelling, Dad, he's getting away. As I ran, I heard the clicking, groaning, rumbling sound begin from the hooded woman once again. The walls all around me began to shake, as I raced back through the underground tunnels towards the staircase. I just hoped that I was right and it was the way out. The entire tunnel was rumbling and quaking all around me, making me lose my balance and stumble as I ran. Behind me, I could hear the voices of my pursuers and could see the flickering light from their torches. At first, I had a very strong feeling that I was not going to make it far, but it turned out that I had the upper hand in the darkness especially since I had marked my path earlier. It was easy enough to remember the first turn, so when I saw the pennies on the ground in the dim light, I knew which way to go instinctively. This threw off my pursuers and it gave me hope. I realized they could not see me in the darkness once I was far enough away. They proudly assumed that I would get lost in the tunnels and that I had no idea where I was going. Little did they know that I was headed straight back towards the exit. They slowed down behind me in the labyrinthine tunnels, and eventually their voices faded into the distance. I made it back to the stairs and I climbed up these steep, crumbling steps. At the top, I saw the secret door leading to the bathroom in the abandoned house where we had come in. There was a chain on the other side that we had pulled to get in, and it looked like a sink plug. I searched for a similar mechanism on this side. On the left, I eventually found it. Pulling on it, I heard the door begin to slide open. And then voices were coming from behind me again. And the clicking sound like a thousand legs on stone. 
insectile but louder. And looking down the stairs over my shoulder with a hurried glance, I saw the man from our history class who had told us about the Dark Temple. He was one of them, perhaps Annette's dad. Everything had been orchestrated to get us out here, to trap us down here. This place was an unholy sanctuary to some ancient and terrible god, subterranean and evil, the many-legged god. The people who lived down here had their own system, their own world, and I wanted no part of it. They needed a fresh offering, though, and they were intent on keeping their secret. The bespeckled man raced up these steps towards me, not yet seeing what was coming out of these stonework on either side of my head. I saw the holes bore out of the stone walls on either side of me, the size of sewer grates. As the door slowly opened, I saw the creatures emerge from their burrows closing in on me, their antenna twitching and mandibles clicking as they sniffed the air. The man reached me without seeing the creatures emerging from the shadows. He lunged at me, and I ducked just as he did so. All I heard was screaming as the creatures attacked him, too hungry to pass up a meal. His red spraying the walls of my face with warm, crimson fluid. As the huge millipedes attacked the hooded man, I moved as quickly as I could out through the open door and ran. Ned's screams mixed with his father's as I emerged in the bathroom of the abandoned house in the woods. I pulled the chain quickly, causing the secret door to slam shut behind me, closing off the madness that it concealed. The wailing cries of pain and terror shut off abruptly as it closed, and it left me with the sound of my own horrified heartbeats pounding in my ears. The light of the sun blinded me when I left the house. It had been so dark down in the tunnels, but my eyes adjusted and I made my way through the painful thorny thicket and I ran back home. As quickly as my legs could carry me, I ran, terrified of every sound I heard in the forest, scared of every squirrel that rustled in the leaves, and every bird that chirped in the trees, thinking each one of them might be a millipede burrowing its way up from the underground to chase after me. No wonder my parents had said to stay out of the forest after dark. This thought should have clued me into what happened next. I should have realized that my parents knew more than what they were saying, right from the beginning. I got home panting and out of breath and begged my mom and dad to call the police. I began to tell them what had happened to Tom and Brad, and they stopped me and just shook their heads. You're getting bolder again, said my father, his eyes thoughtful, staring far off into the distance. I told you we were past time for another cleansing, said my mother. They began making phone calls and stuffing rags into old liquor bottles, I assumed to make Molotov cocktails. Guns were suddenly being loaded and arranged on the table in an organized fashion, and grenades were being set beside them. I didn't even think my parents owned one gun, let alone this arsenal of warfare. I had never realized my parents were so awesome. It'll be dark soon. We need to get moving, son, said my mom, strapping on a Kevlar vest. Now, where did you say that abandoned house was? I am a psychologist. My client sees things that aren't there. Written by, signed, styled, delivered. It's been a long time since I've had a session with Dave. It's not his real name, of course. He had stopped attending therapy sessions in over a year, and I was surprised when he called to book a session. He had first come to me a few months after he had been diagnosed with schizophrenia at age 29. His then partner had shared through a veil of tears about how his quality of life had deteriorated over the past two years. She first became alarmed when he had started to overlook his hygiene, his dressing, not seeming to care about how he appeared to others. He had insisted that he was fine, but then he had withdrawn from his friends and family. He only spoke to her, and eventually started to ignore and neglect her as well. He lost his job, and spent most days holed up in his room, mumbling under his breath or talking aloud to no one. He wouldn't tell her he was talking to. He refused to seek help, despite her desperate pleas. It was only after an incident when he was arrested by the police that he finally began to receive treatment. 
He had climbed into someone's house and nearly been attacked by the owners when they found him in their living room, sat within a circle of lit candles, mumbling unintelligible phrases over and over again. By the time we were having sessions together, he had been stabilized with medication, but the voice he heard persisted. It was not a part of his hallucinations, he insisted. It was real, as real as you and me and anyone else, he said. I had tried explaining to him about his illness, about how the voice, while seeming real to him, was not really there outside of his mind. I try to discuss with him how schizophrenia causes these really vivid hallucinations, but nothing could convince him that the voice was but a symptom. In the first two months after his therapy sessions began, his partner left him. She couldn't handle his deterioration, and she feared that he would turn violent. That was an unfortunate stigma people tended to have about schizophrenic people. In reality, they were more likely to be victims of violence than the aggressors. I continued to see Dave for a period of about six months, but one day, he just stopped attending therapy. He had found another therapist, he had said. I didn't really mind. After all, not all therapists are well matched with their clients. And I was happy that he had found someone who had suited him. Who could help him? Now, one and a half years later, he had called out of the blue to request a session. He had been cryptic on the phone, not sharing why he needed a session now. When he walked into the room, I was taken aback by the change in his demeanor, his whole presentation. He looked healthy, well-groomed, and all cleaned up. He had a glow to his face, a light in his eyes that I hadn't seen before. You look great, I couldn't help but exclaim. Hi, Doc, he said chirpily, and plopped himself on the seat near me. Dave, again, you look great. I'm guessing things have been good. Yeah, I worked it out with my therapist. You were right. I shouldn't resist it. I should work with it. With it? The treatment, these suggestions, those given by my therapist. I smiled and leaned forward slightly. You were right, I had so much trouble. I was in such a deep, dark place, floundering. And so much of it was because I had been fighting against it. I dedicated so much time, so much effort, struggling against it. But you were right after all. The voice, he wasn't someone I should have fought. I let go one day of my need to control it, to stop it, to get rid of it. I let go in the voice, it became clearer, warmer, and then he took shape. He had taken form before, but it had been a hazy blur, something I tried to ignore, willing it to disperse in my sight. But after I embraced his presence, he took a solid form, and he finally appeared to me clear as day. He looks like a regular guy. He has kind eyes. I sat through his monologue silent, not wanting to interrupt. I have to admit, I was intrigued. Dave smiled and continued. He was there, you know, when you were talking to me. He hadn't shown himself properly then, but he was always there, hovering. He took in a lot of what you said, what I shared, and it turns out he's a really smart guy. He had learned really quickly. I think he did his own research too, because he started having his sessions with me, and he was just like you at first, and how he guided me through my feelings, my thoughts. The therapist that he had found had been his hallucination. It was unheard of, at least not in my years of experience. For a client to hallucinate a therapist, who then effectively guided the client to better mental health, it was incredible. I strained to keep my expressions in check. It worked, more or less. I was able to sort out so many things in the year of therapy that I had with him. And he provided therapy free. No offense to you. He evolved too. He started using techniques that you hadn't done with me. So I think he really did do a lot of research. A lot of trial and error. 
So when you said you found another therapist, you meant him, the voice that you've been hearing, and the guy you've started to see. I didn't want to minimize his views, his beliefs. I was careful not to call his hallucination what it was. A hallucination. Not at this point. That would only push him away. He nodded. So, you've been seeing this man. Does he have a name? He's Jones. Yes, yeah, so you've been seeing Jones who's been giving you therapy, and you've felt much better ever since. Is that right? Yes, he's been incredible. I've done so much work on myself that he's always been there for me. Not just in sessions. He's there by my side most of the time. He makes sure I take care of myself. He catches my unhelpful actions and the negative thoughts that I have. While he can't really read my mind, not most of the time anyway, but he catches the looks on my face. When I'm down, angry, anxious, confused, whatever, he catches these moods, asks me about my thoughts, and just does therapy on the spot. It's incredible how effective therapy is when it's 24-7. I didn't know what to say. I was flummoxed, entranced, and entirely grateful to get to be a part of this situation. It was a psychologist's a wet dream to get an interesting case like this. I love complex cases, bizarre symptoms, and this was ticking off all the boxes. This isn't to say that I don't care about my clients as people. I do have a lot of empathy and compassion for them, but I'm just often intrigued by the inner workings of other people. And this was beyond fascinating. So, is he here right now, Jones? Yes, he is. He's checking you out, by the way. Oh, he says to clarify that. He's not checking you out in a weird way. He's just trying to get a sense of you. And whatever that thing is that's hanging around you. My smile stiffened a little. And I suddenly felt a twinge of nervousness. The thing that's hanging around me. Yes. That brings me to why I'm here today. Jones, he likes your work. What you do with clients. I think he's been hanging out around you sometimes. Checking out your sessions with other clients. Learning from you. It's part of his research and development, I guess. I squashed the slight discomfort that had begun to grow. He wanted me to come here today to tell you about some guy... Something he's seen hanging about you. He tried to talk to you, but you don't hear him or see him. I didn't know what to say, so I simply paraphrased his words. Jones has been around me, and he's seen someone hanging out near me. Is that right? Yeah. He told me that there is this figure he's seen around you on a couple of visits that he's made. He's worried. I knew that it was all in Dave's head, but I couldn't help but feel as if he had trickled ice cold water down my spine. I shuddered involuntarily, and I tried to hide it, speaking quickly. He's seen someone here with me, on some of the times that he's been here, and he's concerned? Yes. Wait. He's telling me to tell you. Okay. Apparently, he can sense their auras, others like him. He says that the figure near you emanates something sinister. It feels dark. Something's really wrong with it. I couldn't suppress the sensations that came over me at that point. I could feel the blood draining from my cheeks, my palms starting to sweat. An icy sensation wrapped itself around my neck, making it difficult to breathe. I tried to speak as calmly as I could. This is scaring me, Dave. I haven't seen you in a year and a half, and you've come today to tell me about your friend, your therapist, Jones, whom only you can see and hear. And you've also come to tell me about a figure, an evil being lurking near me, that Jones says he saw. I'm so sorry, this must be really unsettling for you, really scary. And I know how it sounds. But Jones likes you. He wants to keep you safe. To warn you. Oh god, okay. 
He says it's here now. I push back my emotions, mentally forcing them into a little box in my mind. I take a deep breath. Do you see it too? I asked. No, I can only see Jones. We are connected. This thing, only Jones can see it. What does Jones say that he sees, exactly? It's... Dave looked like he was listening intently, and then his face changed, taking on a look of deepening anxiety. He says it's on your shoulder now, leaning on it, kind of, or perched on it. He can't really tell. Every hair that I had stood on end. The icy pressure on my neck seemed to tighten. I had a sudden, almost irresistible urge to run, to pluck myself from the seat and dash as quickly out of the room as possible. I forced myself to calm down. Dave, you're scaring me, and I know Jones, he's real to you, but he's not real to me. And what you're saying to me, though I know you mean well, it's making me really uncomfortable. Yes, that was it. It was all his hallucination. I knew it. Research knew it. Science was on my side. Dave was having an incredibly elaborate hallucination, a delusion, and intricate as the story was. That was all that was. A story. Something he had built up in his mind. His amazing, complicated mind. But still, it was nothing more than his imagination. I held on to that train of thought like a shield and felt somewhat comforted. The surety of science made me feel safe again. A touch of sadness split into the anxiety that was painted on Dave's face. Then he seemed to be listening, looking somewhere to my right. Jones said that last Friday you were wearing a blue sweater and you were rushing into the clinic and you just made it on time for your first appointment. A crack appeared on my mental shield. I had indeed been wearing a blue sweater last Friday, a sky blue one. I was also almost late, and I had been in a huge hurry that morning. Were you following me? Were you waiting outside? I asked, clinging onto the shield. Dave paused for a while, looking again at the empty space near me. You did some chair work with your first client. He told you about his experience with his mom when he was six years old. The mental shield disintegrated. The cold fear seeped through. I didn't respond. I couldn't. Jones says that he's sorry he knows there's client confidentiality involved, and he shouldn't have been sitting in on all those sessions. But he's hoping to make up for it by helping with you with that thing with you now. I couldn't contain the dread any longer. I gave up on my professionally calm demeanor. What is he afraid it would do to me? He says that it's draining your energy, depleting your life force. He's not sure how it works, but just by being in your proximity, it's feeding on you. Jones says that some of these creatures may even have the ability to plant thoughts in your head, influence the things that you do. He's heard of one which made its victims kill someone before killing himself. I stared blankly at Dave. Jones said that he could try to reach out to it and get it to leave, but he's not sure that it could work. Alternatively, Dave trailed off, and anxiety danced on his features. Alternatively what? He said that he could stay with you for a while. He wants to know if you would let him in. Let him show himself to you. He could then guide you on what to do. Apparently it feeds on you mostly when you're unfocused, distracted, when your mind is in shambles. Jones wants to be there to monitor when that happens and keep you focused, strong and clear in thought. He thinks that eventually, if you're consistently being purposeful or clear-headed, it will leave and find an easier target. I couldn't help but chuckle nervously. He can be transferred to me. And a clear head stops that thing. Yes, Dave said. I, I don't want to lose him. But I think I can do without him for a few days. Maybe even a few weeks. 
would you be willing to take him on? The conversation was getting out of hand. Not knowing what else to say, I just nodded. And Dave nodded in return and closed his eyes. When he reopened them, he asked, Do you see him now? With trepidation, I turned to look around the room. A flood of relief surged through my body as I realized I saw no one. There was no one. I had been pulled into Dave's delusions and hallucinations, somehow buying into his stories, falling for the intricate tale his mind had concocted. This was ridiculous. I was a professional, a psychologist. The tension seeped from my heart as I turned back to Dave. I resumed my previous professional manner. Dave, there's no one. I don't see anyone here. I don't hear anyone either. Dave's face fell. You can't sense him. He's right there. He's looking at you. I can, Dave. He's your... He's what you see. I don't see him. Others don't see him. He's there, really. Maybe it takes a while. Maybe it works differently for you. Me and him, we're naturally in tune. Maybe you're not on the same wavelength. I nodded, not wanting to push him too far. Dave, our hour is almost up. Thank you for having been so honest and open with me. I would like to invite you back for another session soon. Would that be okay with you? Dave seemed resigned, but he eagerly agreed to set another appointment in a few days' time. He seemed sure that I would be able to see his truth soon, mixed in with my relief. I also felt a deep, heavy sadness as I bade him goodbye. He was deeply ill. He was entrenched in his delusions, and his hallucinations were becoming stronger, much stronger than when we had first met. He was so steeped in his beliefs that it had swayed even me. I wasn't sure what I could do for him other than continue to suggest that he revisits his psychiatrist to titrate his medication. I felt incredibly drained after the eventful session with Dave. I powered through the remaining sessions that I had with other clients, and gratefully piled myself into my car at the end of the long workday. I nearly fell asleep at the wheel, but managed to get home safely with the help of heavy metal music. Finally, I could relax and eat my dinner in front of the TV. Just some brainless binge-watching ahead. I was microwaving my frozen dinner, hungrily counting down these seconds on the display, when I caught a glimpse of movement to my right. I turned and let out a scream. My heart leapt into overdrive. There stood a man wearing a mustard-colored blazer, a gray tee, and jeans. He had tousled hair, brown eyes, and a weathered complexion. He stared at me in concern. I'm really sorry to have startled you. I wasn't sure how else I could have approached you. Who are you? Get out of my house, I yelled, scrambling to grab my mobile phone. I'm Jones, he said, in a voice as clear as the crinkle on his forehead. I sputtered. I don't know what kind of sick joke you're playing, but... I heard fumbling at my front door before it burst open. My neighbor and close friend stumbled in. We had exchanged keys to our houses before, just in case of emergencies. Are you okay? Her face was etched with alarm. This man, I pointed at Jones, he's trespassed in my house. This man, she stared at me, uncomprehending. What man? I stared at her and at Jones. She followed my gaze and then looked around. Are you okay? Hey, hey, no one's here. It's just us. I sat down on the floor with a heavy thump. She came up to me and hugged me. Are you good? Hey, let me call someone. It's going to be okay. Jones just stood there quietly. I stopped her from making the call. I made it some excuse about being drained tired and on medication. About how that must have just made me see things. I just needed to sleep, I told her, and I ushered her out of my house. I couldn't afford to be seen by others as having lost my mind. My career was at stake. She was puzzled and concerned, but didn't push. She agreed to leave. 
but was firm that she would check in on me again in the morning. The minute that I shut the door behind her, he spoke. It's still here with you. It's grasping onto your back. I think we need to get started on getting rid of it. There's something wrong with the deer on our nature reserve. They've started standing up. Written by T.J. Lee I've lived in this town all my life. I know all the weird traditions that come with living in a place as remote as mine, but nothing explains what happens at our deer park. I used to come out here most evenings during the pandemic, park up by the base of the hill overlooking the sanctuary and just immerse myself in nature. I was always mindful of the distance I had to keep from the deer, particularly during mating season. And it wasn't like the deer didn't know what a car was. These were in their own reserve, sure. But the trail cut right through their vast fields and they had grown accustomed to seeing cars all manner of times in the day and evening. Which is what makes the situation all the more unsettling. Starting last week, a sign was put up on the entrance gate to the park. Impossible to miss as the car slowed and the tires rolled over the metal grades. With it being the late hours and very few cars on the road, I decided to stop and read it in full. A polite notice to our valued visitors entering the Oboro Nature Reserve. Our deer are exhibiting unusual behaviors and we are politely requesting you observe the following guidelines in place as to best protect yourself and the well-being of our deer. 1. While the park is open 24 hours a day, we are recommending visitors do not stop their cars during observable grazing periods and on midsummer nights. You are welcome to drive through and observe from a distance, but please do not slow down or stop. 2. Should you be slowed or stopped at any other time and the deer be curious by your vehicle, act calmly and do not speed up. Let them inspect you and judge you as a safe passerby. If they begin snorting, that is your cue to leave. 3. There have been reports of deer standing on their hind legs and remaining idle in the fields. These rumors are a fallacy. Please do not pay any attention to them. 4. There is a black stag that holds dominion over the western herd. His antlers are sharp and his stride is impressive, but do not attempt to approach him. Please pay him the respect you would normally, and do not stare at any of the females in his harem. He will charge you. Bucks are not friendly. 5. Dear Remember Faces they can recognize you from a distance and will verify your smell as you get closer, listening intently the entire time. There are many of them and only one of you. You would do well to mind that. 6. Lastly, no matter what salacious rumors have been propagating amongst the community, the deer are not congregating in the dead of night. Deer are social animals that sleep and graze together in a herd. This is normal. The deer are acting normally. Drive safely. Keep your doors locked and have a lovely drive in the Obero Nature Reserve. Strange, right? The notice wasn't your usual steel sign with carefully embossed wording. Rather, it had been hastily marked up and nailed to the wall adjacent to the welcome sign, as if in a hurry. I had not heard any sorts of rumors around town, and nobody had complained about the deer park. We're a population of maybe 2,000, so it's not hard for word to get about. But still, I had my routine and intended to stick to it. Some of the info was valuable for newcomers. There was indeed a large black buck who paraded the western herd. His name was Jojo, and I fully believed he would attack anyone who outstayed their welcome or got too close. A beautiful specimen of muscle and authority. He ensured his harem never strayed too far, 
and seemed to be borderline obsessive about making sure they never went across to the eastern side where the large swaths of trees sat. In fact, I had observed him on a couple of occasions actively nudging or ramming younger males away from the split in the road and back to safety. On the rare occasion that a member of the herd crossed the line, he would refuse to acknowledge them and actively keep them away from entering, as if they were banished. As I drove through the archway, I realized I had not seen many deer in the eastern section of the park, looking out my window and staring at the makeshift forest to my right, and a burning question coming to the forefront of my mind that didn't leave as I reached the hill overlooking both sides of the hill. Where are the rest of the deer? It was unnerving to sit there and try to enact my ritual of riding under the clear night when there was a strict absence of the herd where they should be. I tried to focus, but something was pulling my eyes back to looking at that same spot time and time again. Eventually, I decided that I needed to get some fresh air and take a better look, satiate my curiosity and then, with my mind at ease, I could get back to finishing my blog. There is humid when I step outside, no breeze and these stars are out on full display. Thank goodness for no light pollution in the countryside. I leave the engine running and I walk to the barrier that my car is parked in front of, leaning over and taking a pair of binoculars that I bring for its lower days when I want to see the deer in better detail. As I direct my vision to the eastern herd, I see something darting in the tree line. It's quick, hairy, and seem to move the second my binoculars motion towards it. Even a deer shouldn't be that spooked, especially from this distance. My joints seize up and I dang near drop the binoculars when I hear a familiar snorting from behind me. I turn and see Jojo, standing 15 feet from me, just by the rear of my car, his eyes gleaming in my rear lights. His head is low and his antlers are thick, sharp and aimed at me. In that moment, I don't know if he's going to charge and whether I should be fighting for my dang life. But instead, I do as I was instructed and I stay still, not making any sudden movements as he snorts again, closing the gap between us slowly. As he gets within five feet, he rears his head up, and I see the most baffling expression on his face for a fleeting moment. Fear. Something ripples through the eastern forest and birds begin flying away in droves. Some of the deer herd in the western area are circling something, and Jojo immediately bounds down and out of sight to control the chaos. I waste no time getting in my car and driving down after them, keeping the doors locked, the window open a crack and my speed at a decent crawl. As I come along the embankment that connects to the road, I see Jojo running full sprint towards another deer. He knocks the rival over and contorts the body as it skids across the grass and falls into the trail just ahead of my car. I know I'm not supposed to, but I stop the car and wait. In a choice between breaking the rules and breaking my car, I'll choose the former any day. The western herd deer under Jojo's command are gathering behind him making horrific shrieks of terror. Jojo strides up and bows his head again in front of the still contorted deer, antlers on full display and dripping with black blood. It was a clear threat. Do not come back here if you value your life. I started wondering how I would safely get this deer out of the way, or if I could mount the grass on the other side and go around it, when I saw something horrific unfold in front of me. The body twisted itself around and the limbs snapped to reset themselves. The head still cracked at an ugly angle, bones sticking out of these sides as it got onto shaking legs. When it screamed, it sounded as if its lungs were filled with blood. A horrible, muted cry of anguish that backed up every other deer but Jojo. I don't know what was keeping this freaking thing standing, but it let its head flop lazily around 
as it carefully backed away onto the eastern side of the reserve, before bounding into the tree line as if nothing were wrong. My rational mind chalked it up to adrenaline and the instinct to survive, but it was impossible to shake the feeling that something was wrong. I carried on driving as soon as the deer was out of sight, not looking at Jojo or the others as I carried on down the trail. For the remaining few minutes, I felt unseen eyes staring intently at me until I crossed the threshold and back into civilization. I had never been more grateful to see other humans, or my bed. Something about the whole incident just took it out of me. As I slept that night, I dreamed I was a deer alongside Jojo, frolicking in the herd and grazing peacefully. But as I cast my eyes upwards to the sky, a bitter chill in the wind, I saw the moon bathed in an almost purple plume. A strange light cast onto the land and noises rustling from the woods opposite. I don't know how I knew this, but something in me instinctively knew we weren't supposed to go there. I saw shapes begin to emerge from the trees and that same horrible shriek rang out as I woke up in a sweat. I leaned forward to catch my breath and grab a glass of water. As I changed positions to reach for my nightstand, I swore that I heard the sound of something running up the trail to my house. I was probably still half asleep, but that didn't make it any more unnerving. I decided it would be best to drive out the next night and confront my concerns head on. If I'm not going to sleep soundly, then I should use my time wisely and document what I'm seeing. Maybe pass it on to the rangers in the morning, right? When I drove back out there last night, the atmosphere was vastly different. A mist was enshrouding the trail and the majority of the deer on the western side huddled together, shaking and staring intently at the other side of the nature reserve. I couldn't see Jojo anywhere. Strange, I thought. Alpha males patrol their herds dutifully. Why wasn't he there? I parked up at my usual spot and making sure that he wasn't around. I pulled out my binoculars again and stared at the eastern area. The clouds beginning to part as the moon shone through. There was movement all along the tree line as shapes began emerging one by one. I think it took my mind a moment to process what I was seeing. I had finally seen the deer on the eastern side. But they were wrong. Very, very wrong. Standing up on their hind legs and taking confident, awkward steps, they marched out of the trees with their heads craned to the sky, all of them emitting that horrible sound like their heads were being held underwater as they screamed. It reverberated in my ears and made my skin break out in goosebumps. There were dozens of them, maybe a couple of hundred. Some were dragging a structure out with them, others hauling a writhing shape that I couldn't quite see. They congregated in a small huddle, the center of which was obscured from my vision. I looked over to Jojo's herd and saw the fear in their eyes, so many of them shaking and their teeth bared. A primal fear we humans have largely lost in the safety of being the dominant species. But this night showed me, we're not as powerful as we think we are. As the huddle broke away and began walking again towards the edge of their field, I saw what they had been huddled around. Jojo. He was still alive but barely moving and breathing heavily, his eyes glazed over. When he began to come to, he started shrieking like a fawn. It was unnerving. They dragged him to the structure, a primitive set of steps with a hollowed out hole in its center, coated in a thick substance on its sides, just large enough for Jojo to be thrown into. I watched these things. These not deer used their front hooves to hoist him up and into the hole, his screaming incessant the entire time. They stood around it, their necks cracked as they stared at the moan and shrieked. I looked up with them, wondering if what they sought was up there in the skies, a kind of primitive god for these creatures. I should have known better, of course. Whatever god these not deer prayed to, it didn't reside up above. No, 
It lurked deep below. A low groan called out in response. It possessed the same blood-filled lungs these monstrosities had, and Jojo's deer huddled closer together at its roar. Jojo had stopped moving, his crying completely gone as the not deer too fell silent and formed a circle around their altar, snorting in unison. It grew to a fever pitch before something began dragging Jojo from beneath, ripping at his limbs and pulling into a horrific squelch indicated the top had separated from the bottom. The hole spurted out red in chunks of deer as the not deer celebrated, danced in the rain and feasted on the pieces. One final roar rang out from the unseen creature. It shook the ground, and I felt my balance waver for just a moment, steadying myself on the car. I know I should have booked it out of there, but I was desperate to understand what I was seeing, rationalizing that perhaps this was a bizarre art piece. Maybe a protest from an animal rights group or even a bunch of edgy teenagers. But that rational voice in my head grew very, very quiet when I grabbed my binoculars to look again. Every single one of them was staring up at me, emotionless, black eyes fixated on my position. I didn't wait any longer. I drove out of there at a breakneck pace not looking at either side of the park on my exit, and dang near coming off the road with the lack of traction. As I got to the archway, my tires smashing against the grate, I had inadvertently attracted the forest ranger on duty. He pulled me over and walked up to my window, a friendly smile on his face. You know there's a speed limit there for a reason, right son? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, I got a little spooked is all. I smiled back. Nerves completely shot. He raised an eyebrow. You didn't break one of our rules now, did ya? No, I kept to them. It's just, well, Jojo got attacked by the Eastern Deer and I don't think he's doing well. It was just a shock to take in. I figured telling a half-truth would be best. Couldn't exactly say what I thought I had really seen now, could I? That's so well. They make their choices carefully. We don't know much, but we do know not to interfere. This is how it's always been. Animals have strange practices. You get how it is. But so long as they didn't look at you, you're fine. Do you remember faces, after all? Hey, thanks for visiting. Drive safe. He smiled again and tipped his hat before walking off to a station. My blood ran cold and I couldn't get those words out of my head on the entire drive home. But so long as they didn't look at you, you're fine. I've not stepped outside of my house since last night. I live in a remote part of the village and while I enjoy the privacy, it's been a hotbed for strange noises and unsettling emotions. Everywhere I go in my home, I feel like I'm being watched by those same vacant eyes. What happens now? What happens to those they look at? I can't get their eyes out of my head and I can't sleep worth anything either. This isn't going to end until I figure out what they want. I wish I had more for you. I wish I could tell you what the not dear were, what they prayed to, why they sacrificed, what the ranger knew. But there's so many unknowables that it makes my head spin. It's just like being deep in the woods. So many twists and turns, you never know which is the right path to take and what danger lurks behind every tree. I don't know what the deer are doing. I don't know what is going on at that park. But if you value your life, you'll stay far, far away from it. And whatever monster they're praying to. I Hunt Mimics for the Government Written by Christian Wallace What's the worst one you've seen? Jacob asked, lying next to me with binoculars in hand. The young man had spent most of the trip moaning about the drizzly weather of mid Wales, so it was good to hear him sound a little interested in the work. It's hard to say, I replied. You know those big beach umbrellas? Yeah. I saw one of those get blown into a kid's birthday party once. 
The old man goes up to pull the cord to stop it from knocking a few tables over. And next thing he knows, it's wrapped around him and he can't get it off. So, his wife goes to help and then a brother and a cousin. I shrugged. Mimics don't normally get exposed to so many people. It would be like dropping a lion in an industrial meat packing factory. What made it so bad? He asked. And did it just eat a lot of people? Yeah, kind of, I said. Six adults and three children. Thing is, that mimic would have been lucky to get one meal a year, naturally so. Well, uh, it ruptured. The whole thing just burst and it injured itself. By the time we got there, we found it wounded in the pool, screaming like a banshee. While it fought against all that food, it refused to let go. The kids were already halfway to soup, but some of the adults were still alive and screaming. It was like watching slow-cooked ribs fall apart under the fork. I see why that's bad, he said, momentarily falling silent, as he pictured it for himself. Our umbrella's common. Anything that moves in the wind is a candidate because some mimics use the weather to change up their hunting grounds, I said. Of course, it ain't ever that simple. All we can do really is look at reports of missing people and follow up. They're patient, that's for sure. Any as big as this fella, he said, gesturing to the chapel on the plains below. I've heard rumors, I replied, from some of the old guard. Back when the world was bigger and there were less people to fill it, I guess it was easier for these things to hide back then. We have a few reports from old sailors about things that may have been mimics. Shipwrecks that glittered with gold and the promise of loot. No one can say for sure. The information age has hit these things hard. And of course, we've hit them harder. But no, personally, I haven't seen anything like this before. Freaking weird, he muttered. Eyes straining to pick out the faint hint of motion that drove the chapel forward. Move so slow you barely see it. About that, I said. Let's get in for a closer look. I want to know more about how this thing locomotes. The ground was porous, like someone had gone over it with a thousand knitting needles, punching holes straight into the ground. Curious, I took a piece of thin wire filament out of my toolbox and unspooled it into one of the openings. When I pulled it back out, it measured six feet long. Well, that explains the locomotion, I said. It reminds me of a starfish. My apprentice was stood behind me. I could feel him anxiously glaring at the chapel. He had been nervous the whole time that we were walking towards it. It stopped, he whispered. It's, it's looking right at us. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a little creeped out by the way the building slowly rotated to face us. Maybe it was just the way the door and the windows lined up, but I couldn't help but see its facade as a face. Not an evil one either, just a dumb one, like the kind of face that sucks a mollusk out of its shell deep in the ocean. A mindless piece of evolution driven by hunger and nothing else. Minds like that don't have much malice. Resisting them or pleading with them is like begging the wind to change direction. Slowly, the church began to advance. That isn't right, I grumbled, standing upright as I urgently began to put my things away. What's it doing? He asked. What do you think? I snapped. It's hunting us. You said they were ambush predators, he cried. You said they would never actively hunt a person. That I'd have to be an idiot to get caught once I knew what it was. Shut up and get me the duffel bag with the blue tag, I told him. This isn't the time to argue. The boy walked backwards, refusing to take his eyes off the building. For Pete's sake, Jacob, I cried. It doesn't go over half a mile an hour. Turn around and look properly. You could tell that he wasn't happy, but he did as I said. A few moments later, he returned with the bag and I rifled through it to get a hold of what I wanted. A hand grenade. Will that kill it? He asked. Mimics are usually soft on the inside, I said, but honestly, I don't know. I never killed a building before. I pulled the pen, let the spoon flick loose, 
and tossed the grenade straight through the open door of the chapel. Five seconds, I counted them out, but nothing happened. Nothing changed. I had expected a muted thump, or perhaps something even worse, something bad. But there was no noise at all and I found that fairly unnerving. The only thing was that the chapel finally stopped advancing. Is it hurt? If the grenade went off, it has to be hurt, I said. But then again, does it look hurt? The building rotated 90 degrees and began to grind slowly away from us. Behind me, Jacob began to whoop and cheer with joy. Take that, he cried. But I didn't feel so confident. It was unlikely we would lose the chapel and have to find it all over again. The Desert of Wales describes an enormous expanse of arid stony land, unsuitable for anything except grazing. It wasn't a literal desert, and if anything, it never stopped raining. There just wasn't much around to see or do outside of a few lonely buildings and abandoned quarries. Most plant life consisted of hardy lichens and fuzzy moss, along with dense thickets of bristling grass. It was hilly for sure, but I didn't think we had to worry about a building sneaking up on us, so I didn't bother giving chase once the chapel moved away. Instead, I sent us walking north to a nearby campsite where a few hikers had first reported it eating all of their friends. Jacob was less inquisitive now. He hadn't liked seeing the chapel up close and, truth be told, neither did I. Most mimics I had encountered were small. Estimates from other field agents like myself at them as typically no larger than 12 kilograms, subsisting on rats and mice and other vermin, and they might nab a child here and there. And sometimes, we would get a real doozy like a carnivorous closet in some ancient B&B. But the tabletop game image of Mimics were desperately overblown, and I had never personally laid eyes on anything like that chapel, slowly grinding its way towards us. Mimics weren't animals, and they weren't plants either. To see one move around like that, I didn't like it. The campsite, once we had reached it, sure as heck it didn't help. When I had heard about the hikers, I figured they were tricked into going inside the building. But the broken tents and pulped remains told us otherwise. At least two people had been crushed during the night. I could see that clearly from the collection of canvas and pureed flesh that lay on the outskirts of the site. They were the first victims I had been told. Just like the tracks I had seen before, their deaths had been achieved with what looked like thousands of knitting needles punching through rock and soil. And in this case, bone and muscle and fat and skin. They must have been sleeping, I decided, when the chapel simply rolled over them with a glacial slowness. As for the others, that wasn't so simple. Tents were slashed and pulled apart, bones still pink and wet, and they scattered around the fire. This looked more like the work of a pack of dogs than a mimic who usually left a little behind except for bleached bones so clean, you could mistake them for some kind of museum display. They must have tried to help each other, I said as I counted out the fifth ribcage. Like that story I told you about, that's the only way I've seen mimics rack up this kind of body count. They trap one guy and his friends come to help and it just, it just escalates. Most of them inject digestive enzymes like an arachnid, Sometimes that includes a few basic poisons that act on the nervous system. That could account for it, maybe. Jacob didn't respond, at least not to my question. I stayed crouched where I was for a few more minutes, staring at the carnage before he spoke up. It crushed their skulls. What? Look, he replied, holding up a pile of bone chips in his cupped hands. Slowly, he let them all fall through the cracks in his fingers like sand, until a few larger pieces remained. He took one and passed it over and I instantly recognized the bridge of a nose. They're all here. It crushed them, practically ground them into powder, all in one place as well. It's almost ritualistic. No, it's not, I replied. Mimics don't do that. They don't think and they sure as heck don't do rituals. So, how do they know what to imitate? 
Come on, I snapped. Let's get back to the car. He didn't answer my question, he said. And I could tell that he had been working up the courage to challenge me on this for the last hour of the hike. What question? How do mimics know what to imitate? He asked. Well, they don't reproduce, if that's what you mean. What do you mean they don't reproduce? They don't screw. They don't lay eggs. They don't even grow or gain weight after feeding. They're not animals, so they don't reproduce. And on top of that, we have records of things that weren't mimics becoming mimics, I replied. A car for one. There was a closet in the London Natural History Museum that was most definitely not a mimic on the 9th of July, 1991, but which still proceeded to eat three janitors by the 13th of August that same year. There was a brief moment of silence before Jacob's voice suddenly rang out across the windswept plain. What? he cried. Are you telling me these things just, just appear? Don't know, I shrugged. Not my job to know. That's a different department. But, but yeah. Things every day, things can apparently just turn into mimics. So like what? My backpack could become a mimic at any time. Maybe, I replied. What you should be worried about is so can your dog and so can you. It's rare, but it can happen. Sometimes they don't even know. It's just boom and it just happens. You wake up and your wife isn't there and you don't know why. But you suddenly have a funny looking scar on your chest and your tummy won't stop rumbling. I think we have three in containment at the moment. One of them swears that someone did it to him. Is he lying, deluded? Who knows? This time Jacob didn't respond. He walked the rest of the trail in silence while he wrestled with the implication of what he had just learned. There is at any time, probably less than 50 mimics in existence. But once you realize that there's nothing stopping one from popping up in your cereal box, or taking over your car or your bed, yeah, it can be a little tough to sleep at night. Maybe I shouldn't have dropped it on him like that, but my own nerves were playing up something awful on that stony trail and I just wanted space and quiet. Already the sun was starting to dip and the sky was full of grain clouds. We had enjoyed some fairly decent weather so far, but now it looked like our luck was running out and for some reason. I didn't much fancy seeing that dang church coming at us while heading behind the night and a slate of grey drizzle. Instead, I focused on settling down for the night in that kitschy little bed and breakfast that we had scouted on our way up. Sure, we had a long drive ahead of us, but I was thankful that the walking part of the day was over. Oh, how wrong I was. At first, I thought we had reached the wrong patch of gravel because, as I crested the hill, I quickly noticed that there was no sign of my car's roof. But no, I realized the trail was recognizable. That tree in the distance was the same one I had made a note of when we had parked up. Had the car been stolen, I wondered incredulously. Surely not in a place so remote. As my legs carried me further and the rest of the lot came into view, I soon realized the answer was somehow even stranger. My car had been crushed flat. Pulverized might be the better word. It looked more like a stand in the ground than a four-ton pickup truck. A better account would be to say that it had been picked apart by a thousand tiny ice picks until its footprint was nearly as big as an 18-wheeler. It was so bizarre that Jacob looked down at it for a few moments before asking, Where's the truck? That clever thing, I muttered. Not quite sure of how to answer. Not that I needed to. Jacob put two and two together from just looking at it for long enough. No, 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 he said. You told me they aren't smart. Ambush predators, he cried. Freaking ambush predators. That's what you told me. Get it together, I snapped. Do you think every job was a walk in the park? I hoped the stern treatment would whip some sense into the boy, but it didn't work. Instead of calming down, Jacob began to cry and swear and shout all sorts of things at me and the agency before falling over himself and landing on his butt, tears brimming in his red-rimmed eyes.
For a second there, I wanted to slap him, but that was when I realized he had stopped all noise and taken to staring right past me. I turned and saw the chapel about 50 feet behind us, and my skin crawled with disgust to see it so close. Its motion was so silent as to be a whisper and my brain rebelled at the idea that this thing was looming larger and larger. But there was a no denying the sight, whether it made any sense or not. I grabbed Jacob by the collar and hauled him to his feet even as he sobbed. Thankfully, he reflexively latched onto the bags I stuffed into his arms while I pulled out a map and took a look for the nearest sign of a civilization. It was odd, but even with that chapel going no faster than a yard every few 30 seconds, I could feel it like an itching on the back of my neck. Something about a ticking clock can make even the simplest of tasks difficult, and I had to struggle to keep my concentration as I figured out our position and drew a straight line to a nearby farmhouse. Come on, I said, and tugging at Jacob's arm so he would turn from the chapel and start to follow. It's Wales and not Siberia. We can make it out of here, walk the whole way to the nearest town if we have to. Jacob had finally calmed, cast a glance over his shoulder and shuddered. I already knew what he was thinking, even if he never said it. No one wanted to walk that far with that thing coming up on our tail. Where does it go? The sun was down and we had no choice but to set up camp in an open field. Part of me wanted to hide, to march to the nearest bit of woodland off in the distance, and find a hole in the ground to stay out of sight. But I knew dang well that was a bad idea. Our best hope was to keep an eye on this thing, and at its current rate of travel, and the two mile gap that we had put between us and it, I figured we had about four hours before we needed to get going again. And I was going to make sure that we could keep our eyes on it for every second of that time, or at least one of us would. We both needed to sleep, Jacob especially. So for now, having settled down by a small fire with very little cover, I told the boy to catch some shut-eye while I watched. Where does it go? He repeated, and I tore my eyes away from the horizon to look back at him. They don't reproduce, they don't grow, but you can't destroy matter, right? So all the stuff they eat, where does it go? Like that umbrella you told me about. What was it going to do with all those people? I don't know, I shrugged. If it hadn't pushed itself and gotten greedy, it would have probably just dissolved its first catch and at some point later, crapped out a caustic white substance that weighs a fraction of the original meal. That's all that would have remained. But as for the rest of it, we don't know, I said. Come on, you have to try to at least get some sleep. It's freaking freezing, he whined, pulling his coat closer around his chest and neck. I'd give anything for a tent. I almost told him that it hadn't done the hikers much good, but I stopped myself. It would have only freaked him out, and besides, I watched him take my advice and close his eyes. When I looked back, the chapel had disappeared. For a second, it made the breath catch in my throat, but the shock didn't stick around for long. I had known for a while now that the chapel wasn't a simple thing. It had cut ahead of us all the way to the car and it had trashed it. That was the kind of tricky behavior you wouldn't even expect from an apex predator, like a bear or a mountain lion. I didn't much like it, but I started to wonder if this thing was going to get the better of us. Knowing what I did about mimics and how they fed, the thought of this thing catching us didn't make me feel like relaxing one little bit. I found myself hoping Jacob made it through all this. He had asked a pretty astute question back there. Where does it go? I hadn't lied either. We didn't know. But that didn't mean we couldn't guess until boy. The guys at the agency had guessed galore. The longest running theory was that we just didn't see mimics reproduce. But like a bad excuse... That was starting to fray the longer that we held on to it. Ninety years in counting and not one example of a mimic being born in lab conditions. Of us even finding the slightest evidence of that behavior out in the wild. A nest, some eggs, anything. And why the heck didn't they weigh more after feeding? The more we documented them and the more we learned, 
the more elaborate these scientists had to become in explaining it all. The second theory, the newest and what was soon becoming the most popular, was some kind of infection or fungus or something. We've dissected enough of these things to learn a thing or two. Heck, the boss back at HQ had a vivisected mimic pencil sharpener preserved in amber as a desk ornament. It's pretty neat, actually. And what these dissections show is that mimics keep a lot of the original object. They splice nervous systems and strange, discombobulated muscular fibers onto hard, inanimate structures, and somehow it just works. As to why they seem to pick the right objects at the right time, maybe they don't. Maybe this stuff's everywhere and it just needs the right conditions to flourish. Maybe your computer mouse is trying to turn into a deadly predator, but it just can't because every time you use it, it agitates all those little microbial construction workers and it all comes falling apart. But the smarter amongst you will realize this still doesn't answer Jacob's question. It might be the how, but it doesn't really do the why. I mean, after all, where does it go? They don't have stomachs, well not really, they're like arachnids. They suck this stuff up and it just goes, somewhere, we think. There is one more theory, people don't talk about it, not even in the agency. But I think push come to shove, just about any field agent worth his salt would admit to it being the most likely explanation. The scientist who came up with it disowned his own theory just a few days after first posting it to the message boards, but I always suspected it wasn't because he thought it was Nav. He just didn't like it being tied to his name. Can't say I blame him either. Anyway, he posited that mimics aren't separate organisms at all, that they're a projection of something. The reason why they pick specific objects is because there is an intelligence behind them, behind all of them as a matter of fact. They aren't independent organisms, they're more like proboscises attached to a single source. That's why we can't find where the digested food goes, he says. It's getting sucked out of the physical world in front of us and redirected somewhere else. The thought of every mimic ever caught being nothing more than a tentacle, belonging to some unseen force. It fit a lot of facts but it sure as crap it didn't make that scientist any friends. The implication that this thing is intelligent, that it has some kind of memory and might remember us agents, what we do, we don't talk about it much. No one likes to think these things might be able to hold a grudge. When I awoke, it was to the sound of Jacob screaming and for a few brief seconds, I expected to see red splashed across the floor. It just made sense to me that that kind of gut-wrenching squeal would come with a great big helping of red and broken bones. Instead, when I opened my eyes and scanned the horizon, I was greeted with an even bigger shock. The chapel was about 30 feet away. I threw myself onto my feet and suppressed the feeling of revulsion that swept over me, letting that thing get so close. God, it felt like I had woken up to a big fat hairy tarantula crawling right towards my mouth. All I had to survive were my wits and my senses and I had practically thrown both away by letting myself fall asleep without first waking Jacob up to stay on watch. Still, no use in giving in to hysteria, I decided. I stood where I was and caught my breath and calmed down, even as the chapel continued to grind towards us. Up close, that thing was almost grotesque. I don't know how to put it except that it was messy. The thatch roof was frayed and peeling, and every whitewashed brick looked somehow misplaced. The building itself was easily 400 years old, and must have predated silly ideas like blueprints and architecture. It was surely cobbled together piecemeal by rural villagers centuries ago, until some other force had animated it. Its many arching windows reminded me of the clustered black eyes of a spider, lacking any sign of symmetry and intelligent thought. It was stupid, but... It really did make me think of something pulled out of the ocean trenches, like a venomous little anemone. Even as I looked, up close at last, I could see the slightest hint of pulsating webbing behind the dusty stained glass. Veins, perhaps, used to pump blood around this impossible creature. Behind me, Jacob was hyperventilating, but at least his crying had stopped. 
Without me telling him, he started to reach down and grab his bags off the floor, which was good. As much of a disaster as this trip was turning out to be, at least he had bounced back after his first freak out. Throw me that bag, I said, pointing to the duffel that he held in his hand. He did and I reached out to take out yet another grenade. This time, the chapel did not stop. I considered throwing the explosive anyway, trying to hurl it straight through one of the windows now that the door was shut. But our supplies weren't infinite, and it's not like it made a difference last time. I don't understand, Jacob cried. It stopped last time. It was scared. What's changed? I don't think it was ever scared, I said, snatching my things up from the floor as the chapel came closer with every second. We might be able to get ahead of it now, but it's a long hike to the nearest farmhouse. Come on, I added sternly. If we're quick, we'll get there before nightfall. Jacob, I said, nudging him with my elbow and gesturing to the nearby cliff. The stepped rocks made for a surface that was close to vertical, but which could easily be clambered over one by one by a person without any gear. What do you think? He glanced over at the chapel that trailed relentlessly behind us. It did not stop for three hours and neither had we. And while we could not be sure of exact measurements, I was certain that slowly, maybe at no more than an inch per hour, the distance was closing. I feel like I need a break, even if it's just for a few minutes to clear my head. If it forces that thing to reroute and buy us time to catch our breath, it's worth it, he replied. I agree, I said, stepping off the trail and heading towards the cliff. Both Jacob and the chapel followed. Many other time in my life, I would have looked at a series of five-foot climbs as nothing to worry about. Scaling fences and gates is a part of the job, and while I'm hardly an athlete, I'm not out of shape either. But something about stopping to gauge the distance, and then awkwardly pushing myself up one elbow at a time, slowing down felt risky and coming to a complete stop to climb a vertical distance, it felt outright crazy. I just had to hope that it would all pay off in the end. Jacob caught up with me quick enough on the first little step. Without taking even so much as a breath, we both grabbed a hold of the next ledge and began to haul ourselves up. By that point, I was sweating and very clearly out of breath, and Jacob wasn't faring much better but we had already climbed a good distance and couldn't resist the urge to look back and see how the chapel would handle our diversion. I wish I hadn't. The chapel didn't even slow. It scaled the first step as easily as it moved across open terrain. How it did it, I can't be sure. It lumbered the front of itself up at a 45 degree angle and then slowly went all the way vertical. Unlike us, it did not stop at each ledge. The flat surface was too small to factor in for something that size, and unlike us, it didn't seem to find fighting gravity remotely difficult. For a moment there, I caught sight of its underneath and glimpsed a crawling mass of spidery legs that writhed over each other in an impossible swirl of glistening black. It repulsed me, like watching a starfish's thousand little suckers grope and fumble for purchase on a glass tank. Unlike Jacob, who had responded instantly to the chapel, I faltered as the thought of falling into that hive of clicking shapes paralyzed me with disgust. It didn't last long, but every foot of distance mattered. Our planet backfired badly. The chapel had no issue with vertical surfaces, whereas we did. We had stumbled into one of the few scenarios where, if we weren't quick, that thing would quickly run us down. Get your butt going, Jacob cried, and I snapped out of my mortal panic and rushed over to the next ledge. Without giving it too much thought, I threw my backpack away along with any other supplies that I carried, and I dragged myself up and over the stony outcrop. I was barely on my feet when I heard the sound of my belongings being crushed. I only had one last ledge to go, and already Jacob was at the top of it all, reaching down to help. Fighting the urge to look back one more time, I ran and jumped and went to grab his forearm. My hand clasped firmly around his wrist, 
And together, we began to haul me up while my feet scrabbled for purchase on the stone. Along the way, my toes slid into a crevice, and while it helped me push a little further, it was uneven and my foot slid too far down into the wedge. To my horror, when I tried to tug it free, it wouldn't come. I'm stuck, I cried, surprised to hear myself sound so afraid. And Jacob knew what to do. Both hands wrapped around my arm. He pulled with all the strength and I gave it everything I had. We both understood the situation implicitly. It was better to tear my foot off than let it slow us down by even a single second. It came free in the end but not without injury. As I rolled over the final ledge and tried to crawl back up out of my feet. I saw that I had lost a shoe and most of the skin along my ankle. Ah crap, I hissed, tentatively reaching out to touch it. It needed dressing, it needed wrapping, it needed disinfecting. Do we have ice? I wondered, before suddenly realizing that I was in shock and thinking stupid things. Thankfully, Jacob put one arm under my shoulder and was already hobbling me along before the chapel crawled over the final outcrop, righting itself with a thunderous crash. After a few steps, I found that my foot could bear a little weight, and so I began to hop away on my own. I had to ignore the terrified expression on Jacob's face when he looked back on me in the chapel from up ahead. He didn't even have to say it. I knew it as well as he did. The chapel had closed over half the distance. I'm getting too old for this, I said as I limped along, breath ragged as I fought to keep pace with Jacob. You're not even 40, he grumbled. Yeah, but every mess I've made so far has been made by me, I hissed. The cliff, falling asleep on watch. You said the others weren't like this. They're not, I said. Not even close. If, if you get out of here alive... I stopped myself from saying it, but the damage was done. The silence between us hung heavy for long enough to let me know Jacob had absorbed that one little word and all its hidden meanings. Look, I said, you don't need to worry about the job when you get out. There ain't nothing out there that'll bother you after this. You'll still need supervision, but you can rest assured that you're personally up for the task. So you'll give me a good reference. Heck yes, I said. Best of the best. I wanted to broach the topic of how Jacob would contact the agency on his own, what passcodes to use, what names to ask for, but I could see that he was still stressed, so I didn't push it. As it was, Jacob kept drifting ahead of me. Sure, I was putting in a good effort, but at best, I was only delaying the inevitable. Sooner or later, I would be caught and it would be best if the guy knew how to make arrangements all on his own. Do you still have that grenade? Jacob asked. Surprisingly, I did. I haven't returned it to my pocket and not my bag. Probably not the smartest thing to do, I figured. But then again, I might just prefer having a nasty accident instead of falling under that monster's tread. Yeah, I said. But it ain't gonna work, you know that, don't you? Whatever's in those doors, we can't touch it. I'm not thinking about the doors. Jacob gestured to another rocky hill in the distance. Another cliff, he said. This one, we would have to go down. I know that thing went up nice and easy, but I mean, it must be unstable going down one, right? What are you thinking? I'm thinking that thing is vulnerable when it's going down rock at a nearly 90 degree angle. We just need something to pry it loose. And going down a set of stepped cliffs was no easy feat with my bad ankle. But my urgency was such that I didn't mind basically falling these several feet down each one and landing on my hands and knees. It hurt like crazy. And on the second one, I knocked my head so hard I wanted to roll over and be sick. But it was better than the alternative. And even as I fumbled to reach the third... The chapel crested the highest ledge and its shadow fell across me. You ready for this? Jacob asked. He was stood up, a grenade in hand, having waited anxiously for me to catch up two ledges down. You have five seconds, right? Yeah, I'm ready, I said, like I was somehow impressive, 
My part of the plan involved crawling as hard and as fast as I could down each rocky step. It was Jacob who had to wait until the chapel was as close as possible before plopping the live explosive on the shelf above and legging it just like me, hopefully avoiding any injury. Truth be told, calling it a plan might have been a little generous, but you have to understand, we hadn't been able to stop or even think for more than a few seconds at a time. The chapel came onwards, and as soon as I heard the flick of the pen, I began to move, lowering myself feet first while I anxiously counted to five in my head. Soon enough, Jacob followed after me and to my amazement, grabbed my collar with one hand and hauled me alongside with him. It was an incredible feat of strength, even if I wound up breaking three ribs and a fair few fingers, as we both basically underwent a controlled fall. I can't say how far we got, or whether we were protected by the rocks or distance or what. But after what felt like a painful eternity, there was a muffled thump, and we both looked up to see the chapel leaning forward at a strange angle. Oh, crap. I think it was me who had said it. From the looks of it, the plan had worked, and the enormous building had lost whatever grip it had on the stone, and was now beginning a headfirst plunge down the jagged rock face. But we had neglected to consider that we were right in the thing's path. I considered tucking myself into the rocky outcropping and hoping that the building would roll right over me without harm. But even just a fleeting glimpse of its blackened limbs flying around in a desperate hope for purchase made me think otherwise. I could easily imagine those needle-sharp proboscises snagging my skin and dragging me down with it. Jacob, however, came through. He never stopped pulling me by the collar, and in the end, he threw me sideways. I say throw, but it was more like a tumble off to the side. But I don't think you can appreciate how hard it must have been for him to do it. He saved my life in that moment, getting me out of the way so that the chapel went tumbling past, leaving us both unharmed. By the time the dust had cleared, we were both left bleeding and bruised halfway down the rocky steps. Looking at the chapel as it lay on its back squirming like a horseshoe crab stuck in the sun. It had millions of limbs buried under that floorboard, most as wide as needles, some as thick as a thumb. Where they came from or how they were even organized, I couldn't tell. I didn't even like looking at them. They made my skin crawl. Still, I began to laugh as we stared at it, trying to rock itself back upright smashing its roof and walls to bits. If it kept at it, it would soon end itself without any help from us. Jacob started to cheer, and this time, I decided to join in. We made our way down the cliff, and by the time we had reached the bottom, the chapel had stopped rocking and some of its legs had started to wither. I had never seen anything like it, but I couldn't stop myself from thinking that the mimic had decided to abandon the chapel entirely. I watched as it slowly withdrew its legs back inside the floorboards and out of sight, and I had the sense that we were watching this thing accept its final defeat. Freaking heck, Jacob cried, stepping forward as he strained to pick out these strange sounds coming from behind the glass. I think it's dying. That or going back to where it came from, I said, soon expecting a flurry of questions. Jacob was definitely curious, and this time... I would have no problem sharing all my thoughts with him. Only the questions never came. When I finally made eye contact with Jacob, he was looking paler than ever with eyes as wide as marbles. By the time that I saw the pulsating web of flesh that crept around the back of his head, slowly flowing around his ears like melting silly putty, it was too late. There was a sound like a rubber band snapping, and he was snatched backwards hurtling through the open door of the chapel like a sideways bungee jumper. He had been grabbed from over a hundred feet away. Whatever had happened, it was the mimic's final act. As the door slammed shut, it folded the last of its legs up into its insides, and all of movement ceased. It was, and of this I'm incredibly sure, an act of spite. One that not only shocked me with fear, but left me feeling like my chest was going to crumple in on itself. I hadn't liked Jacob much at the start, but I would have been dead a long ago without him. 
and he had shown himself to have a great potential. I had already begun planning how I would help him rapidly rise through the ranks of the agency. With any luck, he would have a career that lasted decades and took him right to the top. All of that was gone in less than a second. Despite knowing him for less than a week, I'm not ashamed to say I cried. The chapel was brick and mortar by the time that I returned with help. We traced it to some abandoned village years ago, and the researchers would go on to spend months poring over its tracks and hunting habits. Most of the evidence came from my first-hand account, and so I was taken out of field duty for well over a year, while being asked these same questions over and over again by slightly different people. It's weird to say, but I was celebrated. Jacob was awarded some posthumous medal and his parents fed the usual BS story about some kind of gas leak. I made sure they rigged the story so it looked like he had died doing something heroic, shutting down some valve before it blew up a few residential houses. But still, it didn't sit right with me that the true nature of what he did would never be known. Maybe that's why I'm posting this, I'm not sure. Since the chapel, I've been trying to get the agency to formalize the idea that these things can be intelligent. From there, I hope I might even be able to get them to acknowledge that there's even more to it than that. A lot of fuss was made over the mimicked withdrawing, but it was treated as a kind of spontaneous death. I'm not convinced. It was like it went slithering back to where it came from, and what worries me is that I think it took Jacob with it, possibly even alive. I only tried once to go back into the field. My partner, an experienced guy like myself, made sure that it was only a little job. Apparently, some grad students were complaining about missing specimens in their secure pathology labs. We quickly traced it to one of the tunnels in the rat's habitat. The kind of thing no traditional scientist would ever even consider looking at. But we knew. One glimpse at it in the powdery white discharge all around it. And let us know. A simple job. Easy too. But it was the note that I found, lying down in the matted sawdust and crap that stayed with me. The handwriting was desperate, but I recognized it as Jacob's nonetheless. It's not eating our flesh, it read, but it still hurts so bad. Thank you all for listening to today's stories. I hope you enjoyed them. Wherever you are in the world, stay safe and sound, and as always, stay creepy.